All right, welcome to the 2018 Philly Chef Conference. My name is Michael Trout. I'm the director or program director for hospitality and management in the Center for Food and Hospitality Management. This is our fifth Philly Chef Conference. It's amazing that it goes on each year, and each year it continues to get better and better. It's an account of the restaurant scene in Philadelphia, but also our presence and ability to attract you know, wonderful speakers to engage our students, faculty, and staff. When we started this conference, we had one simple goal, and it was to establish Drexel as an institution where industry professionals, experts, academics, and students can gather to further their knowledge and discuss the key issues affecting the restaurant industry. Looking at the lineup for the next two days, I'm sure we're going to accomplish it again. This conference, basically planning, is a never-ending journey. It's year in, year out, trying to attract the best people to Philadelphia, you know, to the dismay of my wife. Uh, and just looking back today at one of the uh, earlier emails about one of our keynote speakers, Jen Ag, first time I reached out to her was uh, March 10, 2017. So I've been waiting for a year to hear her speak. Everybody here has been waiting months, so I'll keep this short. I just want to thank everybody for attending and making this event a huge success. So it is my pleasure to announce or introduce our first speaker, Junjo Lee. Junjo is a food ethnographer for Google Food. She's working to nourish modern hungers of disconnection and dislocation through the design of a principle of food care. Basically, caring for those who feed and those feeding us. It is my pleasure to introduce Junjo Lee. Sorry, sorry, So I'll be uh, sharing with you some really uh, new research that I started about uh, uh, in December of last year. And uh, so it's a work in progress. So I'd love to have a connected conversation with you. So feel free to chime in or jump in if you uh, have some ideas. It's going to be about Gen Zs. Uh, how many of you guys are Gen Zs here? Can I? How do you, how do you define yourself? Perfect, yeah. And so two, just two, sorry. Oh, two, wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, so Gen Z's were born in 1998, uh, which is the same year that Google, Food, Google incorporated uh, and became a company. And I think that really defines Generation Z. Um, back in 2015, I think it was a really sort of watershed year for people in market research because for the first time, uh, spending in food service outstripped spending in retail. For the first time, our lifespans decreased since the Civil War. And we started studying Gen Z's because the following year, they were going to start hitting um, campuses, college campuses like this one. So uh, we started studying them for our food industry clients. Um, <clears throat> And then, uh, sorry, just collecting my thoughts. Uh, so yeah, it was really, really exciting. And people were trying to see how they were different from millennials, right? Because uh, it was all about millennials for a couple years. It's just sort of like when I did research projects to determine the difference between US food culture and Canadian food culture. In the beginning, it was really hard, but then it started to be quite how Canadian food culture and US food culture is different. And I, I feel like I'm starting to see patterns now with uh, Generation Z. So, uh, so I'm happy to present. This is, this is Retta. She is an 18-year-old freshman at University of Washington. And I love this uh, picture. It, can you read it? It says, we have Asian snacks. But if you look at the demographic of UW, you can see that it was a pretty smart move to have Asian snacks. Uh, because uh, 20, and I can't read it from here. Sorry about that. Uh, Arlen, can you read it for me, maybe? No, I'll Thank you. Thank you. Which, which is a high proportion of Asians in uh, University of Washington. So it just really makes sense. Uh, and I presented this for the first time two weeks ago in Phoenix for the convenience store uh, retail 
conference. Uh, and you know who prime target is for convenience stores. It's really this generation. Uh, and I was really excited to be up against simultaneous panels uh, against tobacco, alcohol, and processed snacks. And I have to say, uh, my group was the largest, and everybody stuck. It was the last hour of the conference, and they were all there to the very end. So this is the second time I'm presenting this material, and so I'm really, really super excited. Uh, Retta is Muslim. She eats chicken, but not pork. And she took me around to show me the campus landscape uh, of, of University of Washington. So as we started walking down the street, uh, first we went into 7-Eleven, and you can see the ramen next to the roller foods, as well as the salty snacks. Um, and, and then we walked down the street a little further, and you could see H Mart. So there's an H Mart. There's a street in University of Washington called the Ave, and there's an H Mart. And it had all kinds of uh, wonderful Korean foods. And actually, Retta speaks Korean. It's not because she ever went to Korea or she learned the language. She actually learned how to speak Korean because she's an avid fan of K-pop and watches tons of K-drama. So when we were inside H Mart, she was able to tell me, oh, that's you know, chokbal, that's chapche, that's kimpa. She knew all the words, and she can actually communicate. She also speaks uh, Japanese. And then we went into the heart of the campus. And there's, while there's several uh, cafes, there's also a student store. And in the student store, you can buy um, cut meats to prepare. You can buy all kinds of snacks. Uh, but I love the fact that they had this <coughs> vegan um, kimbap. And so I'm just giving you a taste of how I'm starting to see patterns. So bear with me. Um, this is the refrigerator of some Gen Zs. And while I'm sorry about the pixelation, but what do you guys see in refrigerators of 19, 18-year-olds? What? Yeah. What don't you see? Yeah. Yeah, I think they're actually trying to eat pretty fresh, and they're actually cooking and they're preparing uh, foods. It's interesting that the weight manager or healthy eater looks very similar to the athlete. So this is an elite athlete, a college athlete's refrigerator where they're preparing a lot of bulk foods to eat. Um, and it also looks very similar to the veg and vegan refrigerator. And there's quite a lot of overlap in products. But it's really interesting that you don't see a lot of uh, processed foods, but you don't also see a lot of takeout containers either. So when we go to uh, millennials' homes, we see lots and lots of takeout, um, as well as boomers. And it could be a cost thing. But also, I think this generation is really starting to connect with food and starting to uh, cook at a much younger age. Uh, I did the research in uh, Seattle, San Francisco, as well as Denver, because Denver is one of the fastest growing, youngest cities. And I spoke to, uh, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews in dorm rooms, as well as uh, going through cafeterias, in schools, um, as well as in uh, apartments. And all these apartments, there's typically uh, multiple people living together. Um, so that's, that's the research method. Um, and I just wanted to set the stage uh, for a mega food trend that is just driving all food trends, and that is the trend of fresh. And so what we began to see uh, in the early 90s was a trend towards fresh, less processed. And fresh is really a uh, multifaceted uh, signifier. It means so many things that it's a great signifier, and almost it can mean very little things, right? So there's a wide range of what fresh can mean, and uh, it really is driving quality and quality attributes in the food industry. And then we saw a movement. That was in the mid-90s. Then we saw a movement starting around uh, 1998, which is when Chipotle uh, got a major investment from McDonald's. And they went suddenly from 18 to 500 stores in a few years, uh, where there was this expectation for real fresh, 
And so it was actually literally being able to see the food as it was made. And tr that is how uh, I think we talk, think about transparency these days. So food made in real time, made just for me. And I'm, I'm really, um, do you guys see this picture okay? Do you see the Chipotle? It's the original Chipotle by the University of Denver. Do you see the little sign behind it as well? It's hard to see. It's, 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 it's a dispensary. And so I think Chipotle and legalized marijuana are really sort of, uh, you know, really part of Generation Z. They're the first, uh, they're the first generation to grow up with legalized um, pot, basically. And, and we're going to start seeing more and more of that uh, entering into the food st stream. And then finally, I think uh, the way, the place where fresh is today, we started seeing this in about 2014, 2012, is this notion of instant fresh, that you can have fresh at the touch of a button. So uh, more and more consumers used to outsource their cooking to the food industry, and now they're even outsourcing their shopping uh, to the tech industry. So there's just a lot of outsourcing going on. And so as I started looking for patterns among Gen Zs, I saw really three uh, generational uh, trends that are, that's really affecting this generation. The first one is the fact that uh, Gen Zs are really mobile, fluid, and they're calling diversity as difference. Um, they're not really sort of, they're thinking about diversity in a very, very different way. Diversity is difference, and being different is good, says Gabe. Uh, boredom is not having a name, not learning, moving, connecting. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, Gen Z's are in constant change, and they're riding this wave of change, and they're making sense through empathy. Empathy. Secondly, a second big trend is that they're really um, living in a world that's competitive and performance-based. Time, they're time-starved and they're seeking an edge. Um, as you can see, this is a meme from University of Washington, and while their tagline is called "boundless," uh, students sort of make fun of that by saying, "We're pretty bounded." You know, there's a lot of limitations in life. And they just feel like their lives are just so busy, moving so fast, um, and, uh, and they're trying to find an edge in, in many ways. And some of their edges are through food. Uh, and then third, um, what we see is that there's a really high cost and shrinking opportunity that Gen Zs are feeling. They're a generation that was born uh, under the the great, the great Recession. So they don't, like, unlike millennials, I don't think they feel like they have an extended adolescence because they're, they're seeing very, very shrinking um, opportunities. And so this is, this is a group of, um, this is actually a, a, a couple that I interviewed in Denver. They had just moved to Denver because um, Corey's brother had moved there and invited them. Uh, they have both dropped out of college they don't see the value and the cost of a $60,000 a year education. And they're kind of struggling, looking uh, for opportunities. Uh, Corey, you know, uh, is working as a mason uh, bricklayer. And, uh, and Emily is going to start her job as a barista. And uh, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, there's this reconnecting with self, tribe, and nature. And a lot of that is through reconnecting with food and learning how to cook. Uh, Gabe just received some chef knives for Christmas. That was his uh, request because he wanted to cook. He wanted to learn how to cook. And so if I were to really sort of uh, at this point think about, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Uh, it's not flowing for me today. If, if I was to think about the three mega trends driving flavor, uh, it wouldn't be like spicy food or you know bold flavors or um, I think it would be at a very higher level. So I know 
um, when I was at this convenience retail store, they, they were saying, what are the next three flavor trends, right? And uh, people were saying spicy, and after spicy, they just couldn't come up with the next two. <laughs> I don't know, do you guys have the next two? Like spicy, what else is a big flavor trend? Savory. Oh, savory, yeah. I don't think bitter, acidic. Well, anyway, at the convenience retail store, they could only come up with spicy. But if I were to pull it up a little bit higher, I would say, let's look at, let's really look at this generation. And I think these three uh, factors are, are, are changing the appetites of Generation Z. The first is demographic change. So there's going to be more and more increasingly a diversity of flavors as well as a diversity of food ideas. Uh, second is digital change. So uh, digital food life is very, very real. Um, Rachel, whom I interviewed in Denver, said sometimes when you know she, does, she knows she has to eat because she won't get to eat later and she runs out of time, she says, but she's not hungry. She says sometimes she'll look up cartoon images of food to make herself hungry. And for some reason, when she sees animated cartoon pictures, she gets really hungry. So that, that is how she whets her appetite with cartoon images of uh, sandwiches at Pop Belly. It's, this is true. Um, and then finally, um, I think we're really witnessing, uh, for the first time, a generation that just accepts climate change. It's not something you need to believe in or that we need to prove. It's their everyday lived reality and lived experience. And more and more, I'm seeing that they're really, really nuanced and complex thinkers. So they think about the whole interrelated system. And so uh, as, one, as one young consumer told me, you know, uh, I was vegetarian. Now I'm not, you know, because my mom's Taiwanese and I love meat. But you know, she goes further and says, you know, we read uh, Jungle in fifth grade, and we read Silent Spring in eighth grade, and you know, just because I stop eating meat, that's not going to solve the problem, because there's a whole industry and people's livelihoods behind the meat industry. So it's a complex problem. And so I think it's not as simple as just eating crickets or uh, you know, finding uh, the latest bleeding burger. I think it's sort of a really uh, holistic sort of thinking about what we're eating and the fact that actually our food choices have real impact on the future of food. So this is, this is Stephanie and I interviewed her at University of Washington and she was, the, she, was the, she was the person who read Silent Spring and Jungle and her flavor trends are really driven by diversity. It's driven by an active digital food life as well as caring for the food system. Stephanie was telling me, I'm looking for more fun and better foods. And this encompasses uh, all three of these desires. So they're not either or, they're actually mutually inclusive. So um, this is me in Houston in 1973. I just arrived, I immigrated, uh, and you know, uh, yeah. The 1965 uh, ban repeal of the Oriental Exclusion Act is why I was able to come. And it's why our demographics are changing so rapidly. Um, and so fast forward 20 years, 2013, is that 20 or 30 years? Uh, 40 years, <laughs> a little old. Fast forward 40 years, I'm in Houston again interviewing Katie and she was showing me her foods and so I, you know, I kind of said, yeah, that's a typical American diet. Uh, but I asked her, what's the most interesting food that you've eaten recently? And she said, Korean kimchi stew. And I, I was like shocked. And I thought, you know, was this at a restaurant? And she said, no, it was at my sister's house. So I had to go interview her sister. This is her sister, Kara, and her two children. And she's making Peruvian, Peruvian potato soup that she learned from her father-in-law. Um, and so what we can see is demographics in the last 40 years has dramatically changed our food landscape. It's not that we're just getting ideas from the internet, it's just that we ourselves are, are, are different. Our demographic profile is different. In fact, 46% of the 
of 18 to 20 year olds are non-white. And so it's not that we're adopting other food or outside food. This is our food, and it's the food of our friends. And that's how Gen Zs talk about this food. And so diversity is really broadening and deepening connections. Uh, this is uh, the first side is Emily, um, who had just spent um, a summer in India. And you know, for the first time, she experienced food that was so fresh and that happened to be vegan because her host family is vegan. And you know, she said everything just tasted better, richer, with very little seasoning because it was the first time she had tasted that kind of fresh. And as, as Emily defines it, diversity is differences. It's different backgrounds, cultures, regional, global, economic. We are all on different paths and yet the same. And uh, it's really, it's kind of funny, but um, my daughter goes to USF, she's a freshman. And she told me the police department has decided not to use gender or race for um, identification purposes. So if you're on the campus of the University of San Francisco and you're robbed, the, the, the joke is you were robbed by a person. But I think it's not a joke. I think this is really, really real. As we were coming in the door today, there were two greeters. and. Uh, Two people walking in, and one of the people said to the greeters, hi, ladies. <laughs> and the second, the second one walking in said, hi, ma'am. And I was trying to understand that interaction is because it was Billy and Caitlin. But Billy had long hair. So I think you can make these really quick assumptions. But I think more and more, we're getting nuanced. And uh, we're just recognizing that we can be different and yet the same. And on this side, this is um, Brooke. And Brooke told me, you know, very sort of honestly, when I asked her, who is she? She said, I'm the result of a teen pregnancy. And she grew up on ramen, and she grew up on uh, frozen corn. And she's, she, she's trying to figure out her way in the world, you know. And I think um, she's really uh, trying to, um, She's trying to see uh, what it means to be her. And both of these women don't self-identify as Hispanic, although uh, you know Emily's mom is uh, Peruvian and uh, Brooke's dad is Mexican. So they're just them. And as they call themselves, they're a little weird. Uh, you know, I'm open to people who look different. I dress crazy. I like goats and free climbing. Um, I like goats and free climbing. After I graduate, I plan to travel and experience different people and buy different foods to broaden my perspective. And I think this is the general sentiment that a lot of Gen Zs share. And you can actually see it in the way moms are teaching their kids to eat. They really, really are paying attention to food and tr exposing their children to a diversity of food. And as they put it, you know, limiting Limiting, uh, having kids who have limited food choices, just limit them in the world. And so food is the one area where they're, they're teaching their kids to have a broader, deeper cultural experience of the world. The second um, main influencer of flavor trends, food trends, is digital food life. That it's a reality and it magnifies the diversity and intensifies connections. This is Rachel who um, used you know, cartoon sandwiches to get hungry so she could eat lunch because she sort of lost her internal clock of when she's hungry. And the way she wakes up is her mom sends her this lovely you know, good morning gif. Um, and so you know, in, in very real ways, uh, Gen Zs are just super connected to each other. It's not a device. It's not the internet. It is their life. In fact, uh, in 2012, when we started doing these deprivation exercises with uh, digital phones, uh, millennials would totally be able to imagine a world without a phone. And they'd say, well, I'd be lost. I'd, I, I wouldn't know where to go. I wouldn't know where to be because I won't have my calendar, et cetera. And when I tried the deprivation exercise with Gen Zs, they couldn't even really fathom my question. It just like they couldn't make sense of what I was trying to ask them to do because they've never experienced a world without digital connections. 
And the digital really enables them to connect and reconnect across spot, uh, space and time. Uh, as Gabe was telling me, Google is my most reliable virtual friend. I ask Google for everything, maps, homework, cheap flights, random questions, recipes. Uh, and so, you know, and uh, Janet and Gabe are both Hispanic, but they come from very, very different uh, worlds. Uh, Janet's mom was a single mom from Mexico uh, and sold food on the streets to support her family. Uh, Gabe, Gabe's parents are diplomats. He grew up all around the world. Um, last, last place he lived was in, um, in China. And what was really interesting is that Janet said inclusion is a feeling of being, belonging, even though you're different. Gabe and I are really different and the same. And so maybe it's because I am a cultural anthropologist and I have this sort of, uh, I favor empathy <laughs> and I'm always looking for ways that we're um, lessening the gap of othering. But I have to say, I think this is really a pattern that I'm starting to see with Gen Zs. They're not seeing us versus them or the other. They're just seeing differences and they're accepting and including. And so food could have been maybe uh, for the generation before a more of a political choice, an identity choice, and it's really become just a personal choice when I talk to Gen Zs. They're not using food to judge or to other. And so here's, um, and here are four ways in which Gen Zs use their, have these active digital food lives. The first one is to discover, um, you know, uh, um, Lily, who goes to Columbia, was telling me it's so easy to uh, find food. Um, and she plans her whole life around some new uh, uh, cuisine, ethnic cuisine, to try. Her roommate's vegan, and so she says, you know, I'm really into Cuban food, but that's not a problem because it's so easy to find Cuban vegan restaurants. You just type in vegan, and they all pop up. Um, this was on... Uh, this was on... Um, Rachel's phone, and uh, it's sort of like the low version of, dis of Discover. It's a shot of whiskey on a, on a, in a donut, and it's the latest thing in Denver, I don't know, but <laughs> I haven't tried it. Um, but, you know, she collects these things, and she collects them not necessarily to try them on, but just because they're weird and interesting and fascinating. Uh, we're also using digital food lives to share and so um, actively sharing. We don't know who we might be sharing, but we're sharing. Uh, I interviewed this guy, Jay, um, a while ago when he was in high school. And he said, you know, he started seeing this cooking show on YouTube. It was this cartoon. And he decided he was going to get into cooking. And he was going to host dinner parties uh, when he was in high school. And he said it was a really great way to meet girls. So we're actually, you know, we're discovering and sharing food. It's not just in the digital realm. It really moves back and forth. Um, and then the other ways that we're having active digital lives is we're actually literally making food uh, and we're trading food. I find this app up here really fascinating. It's a way to like split bills, but you, you, you don't just see what you owe someone or what someone owes you. You can also see what all your friends are owing each other, and I think that's, that's really cool. And then finally, the final driver of food uh, trends is climate change. And it just really is an everyday felt reality, and uh, Gen Zs are looking for green collar opportunities. I mean, given the fact that it's so hard to pay for college, it's so hard to find opportunities outside the STEM fields, they're looking. And this is, this is my youngest consumer um, that I interviewed, and he, Taylor, and um, these are all his favorite things. So can you guys see what, what his favorite things are? Cats, animals, sriracha, Reese's Pizzas, his Xbox, uh, his drink, and then the one thing that uh, I didn't share with you but I got to document um, quite well is his his pot, so he smokes pot a lot. Um, <laughs> it was in his bedroom. He 
he eats there and does a lot of plays there. But um, he said, I'd rather be doing something good. He works in construction right now. And he's been going from like siding construction to intercom construction. And you know, he hasn't really found his place yet. But he said, I'd rather do something good that's good for the environment. I want to help, not hurt. And when I asked him, what do you want from companies, from food companies, he said, I wish companies would stop being greedy and care more about people. And I'm hearing this message more and more um, across all the Generation Zs that I've been interviewing. They're saying, why is good food so expensive? Why does it cost so much? You know, um, It shouldn't. Or maybe it should. I'm not sure. And so in very real ways, uh, they've gone through loss of seasonality. Um, there is global war warming. There's, you know, they've lived through the droughts and the fires. Um, and there's also a sense of reconnecting with nature. Uh, they're really into hiking, mountain hiking, climbing, and transparent companies. If you look at Sophie and the stickers, it's really interesting that she has the elephant sticker right next to Patagonia. And actually, she was trying to hide the elephant sticker because she felt a little uncomfortable, given where she was, to um, expose that. But she said a sticker fell off. But I love the fact that they're sitting side by side. Um, yeah. And then uh, this is Tenzin at University of Massachusetts. He, uh, he you know, is for, um, he works for PETA. He's tabling for PETA. And you know, his question is, why do we have to eat meat? And so I think a lot of the veg and vegan, it's not vegan for life or exclusively vegan. I think it's much more about really trying to understand our role as eaters in the greater food system. And it's driven by animal compassion and better health, not just for ourselves, but for the planet. And so finally, I just wanted to uh, share again the three flavor trends, I think, driving Generation Z. First and foremost, diversity. There's this huge sort of renaissance of food that's broadening the world um, through our tastes. Uh, this is Stephanie, and you can see a picture of Stephanie. She's a student at UC Berkeley. She says, I'm always in search of tasty food. I just came back from Korea. Everything was yummy. I looked for best restaurant and must eat in, and she said it was all there for me to try. Uh, she also detoxed on fruits and vegetables when she got back from her trip, and she said, wow, I didn't realize how expensive it was you know, to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, she also has a really, really active food life. This is her foodstagram, and these are her truffles that she made over Thanksgiving. Um, she said, I, uh, she said I, I made these truffles because I'm a baker, and I have this foodstagram. I post at noon while I'm walking to or from lunch. So it's just part of her daily routine to do this. Uh, and she talked about just having a place to store really pretty, interesting things. And part of that was her food life, documenting it. And then finally, uh, climate, climate change. So uh, I really see uh, Generation Z being food systems eaters. You know, and that, that their choice in food is driven from political to personal choices. And so when I, when I do ask them, what is driving? What is driving your food choice? Or how do you define quality? You know, they start by saying, well, it has to taste good has to have really good flavor and satisfy me. So it's the food itself. And you know, they, they were telling me, you know, you can't fool me. I know, I, know what I, I know what I'm tasting. And don't get me wrong, right? Taco Bell, uh, you know, crunch wrap, and um, they're, they're really tasty. But, and they're in its own category. Um, but just be honest about what you're, what you're offering is what they're saying. And then secondly, what drives their food choices more and more is uh, 
I want to know where the food comes from so I can understand it and so I can know my impact that I'm having through my food choices. Thank you. Thank you, June Jolie. That was really interesting. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rose Trout, Program Director and Assistant Clinical Professor of Culinary Arts and Science. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ali Buzari. So Ali is a culinary scientist. He's an author, educator, and co-founder of Pilot R&D, which is a culinary research and development company he is also founder of Render, a new food company that focuses on collaborations with the best restaurant chefs in the country on how to reinvent the way that food lovers eat. Ali recently channeled his expertise in applying the universal principles of science to all corners of the food industry in his first book, Ingredient, Unveiling the Essential Elements of Food. So Ali began cooking in restaurant kitchens when he was an undergraduate, and in 2011, he started teaching at the Culinary Institute of America while pursuing his PhD in food biochemistry at the University of California, Davis. So for his dissertation, Ali stayed true to his roots as a cook and a collaborator, and he collaborated with three Michelin star French, the French Laundry to study a uniquely culinary topic, so that's cooking vegetables with sous vide and he's been thinking outside the box ever since. So in 2016, I met Ali in Denver at the Research Chefs Association Conference. I knew he'd be a really perfect compliment to our other speakers at our chef conference this year. So as a chef with a PhD in food biochemistry, Ali has a real talent for making complex ideas relatable and understandable for all people with a love of and serious interest in food. So I know there are a few scientists out there. I know there's a physicist, at least one, and a few biochemists and other chemists as well. But you don't often hear the terms biochem and relatable in the very same sentence. But after you hear Allie, it'll all make a little bit better sense to all of us. So with that, join me in welcoming Ali Buzari as our next speaker. Hello. Hi. How are you guys doing? Limber? Can we turn the lights down but one perfect spotlight? <laughs> this is going to be it. I say limber because we got 20 minutes to get real weird together. So get ready. Um, yeah, so I have a PhD in food by him, which sounds very impressive, but um, I spent a few years cooking mashed potatoes at the French Laundry. <laughs> wrote a 356-page dissertation on the greatest mashed potatoes in the world. Um, it took three weeks to figure out how to make the best mashed potatoes in the world. It took the next four years to dig into the rigorous uh, scientific firmament in order to get a PhD. And uh, there was a moment when I was at Davis, I I've been a cook and a scientist since I was in high school, and trying to balance both of those equally. There was a moment when I was at Davis um, where I was teaching part-time at the CIA, the Culinary Institute campus up in uh, wine country. Um, I was collaborating and consulting for most of my favorite chefs, uh, people like Courtney Burns and Mark Tartine, or Thomas Keller at the French Laundry, or Corey Lee at Bennu. Um, and there was this really interesting uh, reckoning that happened where I would start my day studying the fundamentals of mashed potatoes. I would go to the CIA and I would teach a class to a bunch of 18 year olds um, about how to thicken their hollandaise. And then I would go to Yonville to go to French Laundry Bouchon and talk to those people about probably mashed potatoes. Um, and so everything was, everything was very thick and creamy at that point in my life. <laughs> but the crazy thing was is that it was it was universal thickness. Um, I, I had, so, I started doing, that would be an amazing album title. Um, I started doing a 
this work with chefs, it, it, was, a, it was a dream moment, um, getting to teach at CIA, getting to work with um, some of the best cooks in the world. And I had arbitrarily separated in my brain how we needed to talk about how cooking works to somebody fresh out of high school who's never cooked before versus one of the titans of the industry. And one of the things I realized was that it was all the same. We would be having conversations about making french fries at the CIA and then conversations about crispy roast chicken skin um, at a traditional star restaurant. And I realized I was explaining things using the exact same metaphors. And that we were actually touching on the exact same fundamental patterns in nature that make everything happen. So after that, I um, wrote this book, uh, wrote an article for the San Francisco Chronicle that was called Crispiness Doesn't Care How Many Michelin Stars You Have. Um, and we're gonna do that right now. So, um, I, I am part food scientist, but I'm often very pissed off at that part of my background. Um, using traditional food science, which is absolutely indispensable fundamental knowledge about how our universe, edible universe works, trying to use that to cook is like being in Tokyo, seeing a little kid trying to cross the street about to get hit by a bus, and saying, hang on one second, let me just check my phrase book for how to say don't get hit by that bus. <laughs> right? It's an incredibly unwieldy thing. I, I learned how fermentation works for 12 years in different classes without ever being able to wrap my head around sauerkraut until actually cooking it. So um, at Pilot, um, we are the people who are running the R&D programs at one point or another for well, Fugu, for the Fat Duck, for Saison, um, for the Thomas Keller Restaurant Group. The way that we do that, the way that we talk to people, be they crazy awesome chefs or um, people just trying to microwave a hot pocket in a dorm at 3 a.m., is weaponizing food science. Turning it into something that you can apply and you can have fluidity and fluency. So cooking is hard. There's a lot of stuff happening all at once. And if you ever have to stop to science, you're going to lose. The bus is going to hit that tiny Japanese tip. We don't want that. Right? Um, my goal and, and the goal with this book and the goal with the 16 remaining min minutes of this crash course in X-ray vision is to give you exactly that, to give you a superpower that you just see and feel as you're looking at a cappuccino or as you're searing a scallop in a pan or as you're watching toast burn in your oven. Does that make sense? Who's with me? Cool. All right, so the whole paradigm is this. These... This, this is the level that we currently swim at. If you're at culinary school, or you're in a restaurant, or you're developing a new food product, or you're just at a potluck, people are gonna ask you questions like, what did you do to the collard greens? How did you get the onion to turn brown? Uh, and what are you gonna do with the brisket? Everybody agree? Those are ingredients. Um, lowercase i. In a moment of being drunk with power, we came up with a new term, which is ingredients with a capital I. Absolutely every single thing that you will ever cook, eat, serve, or write about again in your life is dictated by the invisible ballet that these eight things enact. Um, so it's water, sugars, complex carbs, uh, lipids, proteins, minerals, gases, and heat. Lipids may be the only word non-chemists are not super with, right? It's just fats, oils, greases, everything greasy. I got tired of writing that over and over again. So lipids, that's the only jargon we're allowed here. Um, this is it. This, this is the whole thing. Who in here is not a physicist or a chemist? Cool. You're the people I want to talk to. Because cooks aren't either. Um, cooks aren't either and still can't you. So, um, this, this is not a crash course in chemistry. Um, what we wanted to do was turn this information into the comic book version of how science works. So, I hired a comic book artist. And we illustrated the whole thing. And um, I hired a friend who's a Nat Geo filmmaker, and we photographed the whole thing in a really weird way. And the idea was when I went to an amazing coffee shop today, and I had a cappuccino, and I had a foggy moment where I was just like, proteins are doing me a solid. <laughs> and and there, there's an element to the way that we see food, which is just knowing the, uh, the MOs, the personalities of each of these ingredients in like a shorthand way. So there's only five things that water does in all food. There's only a couple things that gases do in everything from steak to a baguette. 
And they are repeating patterns, right? You don't need to be a, a huge film head scholar of American cinema to know that Robert De Niro is not going to play the young ingenue next door in his next role, right? Like, that's just something you know. When you invite, say, eight friends over for a dinner party, you're doing a lot of really complex social calculus in who you invite, who you don't invite, they used to date, that person really hates lamp, whatever. That all happens below the surface of your brain. And that's what can happen if we look at food this way. So, um, when we dive into what water does, this is it. These are the five things that water does in literally all food ever. And the idea is to learn each of these tricks, not in a way that's about memorizing equations or anything like that, but just things that you have to recognize in nature. So, has anybody here gone to culinary school? Taken a culinary class? Consumed sauce. <laughs> cool. So, in culinary school, there's a lot of time being, pen, uh, being paid attention to when you're making sauces. There's a lot of like white hats involved in making sauce. And um, it's really crazy because in, in culinary school, you're taught the mother sauces uh, on different days in different units. And the idea that you would teach white and brown roux-based sauces on different days is super crazy. So here is the, an example, probably the only example we'll dive into in detail, of, of how this mindset works. There is only one universal way to make stuff thick. This is the thinnest liquid that we will find in the kitchen that we can eat without dying. The reason that water is super not nappe is because each individual water is a little tiny invisible marble that rolls back and forth. So when you tip the bottle or you swirl it around in your mouth, it's very thin because there's nothing in water's way. All sauce making, batter, brewing beer, drinking wine, commenting on the blah, 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 that is all a function of either removing heat, which slows everything down, everybody with that, or putting shit in water's way. That is technical jargon. <laughs> that stuff can, can be any of the other ingredients. So, uh, who in here is a bartender? When you make syrups, syrups are thicker than this because there's little tiny sugars that are in water's way. So rather than going directly from A to B, they have to take a long, convoluted route. Right? Uh, the, the froth on top of that cappuccino today was proteins at work making water's life hard. Right? When you're emulsifying a, a sauce, when you're making hollandaise, you're making a mayonnaise, you're whisking giant fat bubbles that water has to now navigate around. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And when, I mean, that was super cool to hear about um, Gen Zers getting away from fake food. What's really fun is that the science of the hummus they make at Zahav is the exact same science of like the xanthan gum that they whisk into Hidden Valley Ranch. That's, there's, there's no value statement there. It's just, we're, I'm trying to turn people into Keanu Reeves at the end of the Matrix, where you just see the code, right? It doesn't take you out, you can still swagger around and wear a cool trench coat, but you, you, you see how it all works. So, from there, let's talk about sugars. This is everything that sugars do. Who in here is a pastry chef? Cool. You do not have time to this. This is just as important for coffee and for salad dressing and for Doritos as it is for pate um, Sugars do this. And when it comes, if we get out of the super fancy culinary world and we talk about um, retail products and consumer trends, we keep deciding as a society that one of these fundamental eight ingredients is bad, and then we spend about a decade hiring clueless food scientists to try to dig us out and give us a free lunch. So um, right now, sugars are the terrifying demon that's going to pop out a can of Coke and stab you in the jugular. Um, so we're finding all kinds of different ways to not have sugar in our food. Um, sugar doesn't just make things sweet. So putting stevia or monk fruit or some other plant from the Amazon that weeps virgin tears of sweetness with no gills, that's not going to solve it. You can't make sorbet without sugar in quite the same way because sugar is helping that water not crystallize and become icy. Has anybody ever had Halo Top ice cream? 
So the point of Halo Top is to do stuff nutritionally to ice cream so that the, dim the, the collective dementia that is the American culinary world, um, we can eat an entire pint of ice cream and feel okay about it. Halo Top super smooth and creamy? Nah! It is incredibly icy and in fact in their messaging they tell people to let it temper on the counter so it melts a little bit and the edge comes off of some, some of those ice crystals. Right, so sure it's important. <laughs> we laughed at ourselves now, let's laugh at ourselves in the 90s. So we were so terrified of this stuff that we ate Alestra fried potato chips on purpose. <laughs> we asked for that. We also asked for white bread back in the day because racism, but yeah. Um, when you take fat out of food, so Philadelphia cream cheese, just to pander, right? Uh, when I was in high school, fat-free cream cheese was a thing that all the people in my lab coats were frantically trying to make happen. They made it happen, and the problem was they focused only on this. They wanted fat-free cream cheese to be creamy. So anything you put in water's way is going to thicken it. You take fat out, what do they replace fat with? Gums, carabina, all the stuff that Dr. Oz is going to rant about, right? So they put that in there, which whatever, they made something that was passively creamy, maybe not something you want to eat. But they forgot about the rest of this. Specifically this. One of the things that fat does really well is sores aroma. There's an old, like, cook's cliche that fat has flavor. Fat's a really good place to store aroma. And so if you pull all the fat out of your food, um, you have created fat-free cream cheese with the like complex, delicate aroma profile of the stage. Right? Um, and then heat. Uh, we're, we're not going to dive into all these, but heat is amazing. Um, in the book, I, I talk a lot about how water is the, the stage on which all of these ingredients perform. Heat is the conductor. Heat is the director. Heat sets the tempo. Heat sets the mood for all of these things to happen. And people define cooking sometimes as the application of heat to food. Heat only does these two things. Makes up move faster, which is why uh, when you heat up your halo top, you, those ice crystals will melt, and it tastes like ice cream soup. Um, and it makes up vibrate, which is basically how reactions happen. This is the most gross, reductive version of chemistry, but this is, this is, this is what helps you cook. When you are caramelizing sugar, you have sugar in a pot, you're heating it up. At, at, you guys ready for interpretive dance? It's gonna buy me an extra two minutes. Sugar at room temperature, like all things, is vibrating. It's shimmying. And as you crank up the heat, that shimmy becomes a little more aggressive and ostentatious. When things brown, when things caramelize, when, when anything happens in your food, there is enough heat to cause wardrobe malfunctions. Where the shimmying becomes so aggressive that sugar is literally explode. They shatter apart in different fragments. And the reason that caramel, well, somebody named for me the flavor profile of sugar. Like, describe all the notes. White cane sugar. Cool, all right, done. <laughs> now, caramel. One ingredient, white cane sugar blown apart by heat. Sweet, sour. Maybe umami, a little bit bitter, very nutty smelling, smells like butter, smells like caramel, right? It's, it's this crazy complex thing. And one of the reasons that caramel is so complicated is because you've blown sugar apart and your taste buds and your nose recognize things by shape. More different shapes to grab onto, more different things to tell your brain. Cool? It is cool. <laughs> so uh, the way that, the, I, I think the only way to make this work for people apart from physically giving you things to eat, there, we, we decided to not put any recipes in the book. There are enough recipes. I was at a Berkeley lecture one time where Mark Bittman was there, and somebody said, what's your next book? He said, well, my last book was How to Cook Everything. Do we need more recipes? Um, the, the thing is, I, I, I'm, this is not like a modernist cuisine, like the 70 steps to the perfect hamburger moment. You should cook how you want to cook. You should cook the food that you want to cook. I just want to give you superpowers so that you have better control over what's happening. And the best way to do that was with examples. So rather than recipes, we talk about examples. Enzymes are the future. They're like, this is going to be the thing that if molecular gastronomy was still a thing anybody talked about, that there'd be so many op-ed pieces about, what are chefs doing with enzymes? 
This is, gonna, this is amazing. Um, enzymes are tiny little protein robots that can either build stuff up or break stuff down in your food, which is responsible for the gooey ripeness of uh, good blue rind cheese. It's the reason why you cannot make uh, pineapple jello with fresh pineapple juice using gelatin. Um, I put a lot of fruit in my cereal as a kid, and I just experimented around, and pineapple day went super poorly because of enzymes. I made it ricotta. Um, it's, it's the reason that apples turn brown when you cut them, which is maybe bad. It's also the reason that uh, oxidized tea is brown and delicious and has all of that complexity, which is good. And so there's part of this where we're, we're taking away good and bad and just giving you tools. So um, in, in, at CIA, that was like a pastry chef's favorite example, a uh, chef instructor's favorite example. You can't make pineapple jelly because uh, the enzymes in pineapple will digest gelatin. Okay, that's bad, according to the dark ages of how we talk about food. Now, we don't see this as, as, as a problem, we see it as a, a miniature scalpel. You can mix small amounts of pineapple juice into your wild sourdough starter, and all of a sudden, you end up with bread that if done properly is incredibly savory and sweet and browns a bunch, because you use those enzymes to chop apart proteins and carbs, right, gluten and starch, into basically MSG and sugar, <coughs> naturally, in situ. And, and so the, the possibilities here are uh, whatever we make them. Sugars bind water, cool. That is not just the reason that a, a popsicle is not as icy as ice. That's the reason that every Thanksgiving there's a new turkey brining recipe that comes out, or chicken brining. Um, that's how preserves are preserved, and candy bacon is candy. And it's the reason that cupcakes don't have the texture of a baguette. All because of one thing about sugar. Minerals, they make stuff salty, but they also help uh, bind things together. <clears throat> so, um, tofu, the way that tofu is coagulated is you just put magnesium in, in soy milk. Those magnesium with the minerals grab onto one protein, grab onto another one, and like He Man, like bring them together, knit it together, create a net. Um, who in here is anti Velveeta? You should all be, it's super gross. Um, I'm pro Velveeta, I'm originally from Austin, so queso. Um, even if you hate it, what is the dark, mystical wonder of Velveeta? Not last forever. Like, why, why do people enjoy it? Even people who said it now. Because it melts. It is the meltiest son of the bitch in the world. Right? <laughs> that is the best melting cheese in the world. Okay. Who in here has ever had a fondue party go super awry? <laughs> Everybody in here has had fondue seeds. That's what it's made for. Swiss people are lying. Um, how does that work? So, if we're trying to make stuff melt, um, cheese is curds made of what? Protein, milk protein, right? Milk protein comes together in curds to make cheese. I did it with my pineapple and my milk. Um, when those curds are together, what's holding them together? Apart from proteins wanting to high five. Why is milk good for you and your bones? Calcium. So minerals bind stuff together. There's calcium holding together all those proteins. If you're trying to melt your $30 worth of gruyere, you have calcium keeping those proteins from separating. So you end up with like an oil slick and clots. Velveeta, the dark science of Velveeta is that somebody figured out a compound, sodium citrate, which is just, it's another salt that vacuums up calcium. It strips the calcium off of those milk proteins so that they can just put it with it. So, um, I, I went to, uh, I, when the book came out, I went around the country to like 60 different restaurants, from crazy fine dining restaurants to Franklin Barbecue in Austin. And um, I got to do an all-hands <laughs> workshop for Love Madison Park. And Daniel Hoom, who's super famous, amazing, kind, very tall Swiss dude, um, <coughs> gasped. All right, what is the actual secret to perfect fondue? It's not the perfect kirsch or like a modified starch from a uh, modern's pantry. It is a one by one inch cube of Velveeta thrown into your pot before you add all your fancy cheese because that same compound will do work for you. So when I said that, Hume goes, no. <laughs> um, I'm gonna wrap up now. So okay, let's say uh, you, you've, you've taken the time to go through and, and figure this all out. How do you apply it? There are two ways 
of applying this way of looking at food to making stuff better. Um, number one is what I call crisis mode. Crisis mode is this. I need something to happen. How does it happen? I need this food to turn brown. My, my granola is not turning brown. I need it to turn brown. Well, you can call up that sugars and proteins or the napalm that make that stuff happen. Put more sugars and proteins on it. Has anybody ever uh, marinated something in miso? Like something to be grilled? And then proceeded to burn the shit out of it the first time? It's because you've got a bunch of broken down, activated sugars and, pro and proteins ready to go. You add heat. Uh, remove water, you're going to be good. If you want things to be aromatic, we talked about they need lipids to live somewhere. Proteins can sometimes do an okay job. If you want something to be crispy, add sugars, proteins, or carbs. Remove water and heat. So, sugars, if you want things to be crispy, the top of a creme brulee is crispy. I think the best pork shoulder in the world is what they do at Mamafuku, where they rub the whole thing in brown sugar, they slow roast it, then they take the pan drippings, add more brown sugar, and make a uh, reduced pork caramel, pork caramel, and then they <laughs> brush it over it and relay that. Right? It's the same science. Uh, if you want protein to be crispy, that's rendered bacon. That's all those Parmesan crisps that are popping up that have the texture of potato chips but without carbs because it's just protein. And then carbs make stuff crispy. I think we all have PhDs in that. Um, if you want something to be juicy, you obviously need water. If you want that water to stay there, you need minerals and or sugar. Do you guys see how this is the same it's almost like there's just eight ingredients that do all this stuff, right? It's the same stuff over and over again. If you want things to be savory, you need protein, you need MSG. That is a soapbox moment for another time. MSG will not give you migraines. Um, anyway, <laughs> last thing. All right, let's say that you're, you're not necessarily looking to just survive, but you have a moment for creativity. And you're presented with an egg or a walnut or a box of tomatoes the last of the season. Um, what do you do with a walnut? What are some cool things you can do with a walnut? Get it out of the shell. Get out of the shell. Cool. Once we have shelled walnuts, what do you do? Chop it. Chop it. Toast it. Okay, so we, we, uh, we talked to 37 Michelin stars worth of American fine dining chefs, and the thing that everybody came up with was toast it and sprinkle. <laughs> so, for, for yeah, this is just off the top of their head. Obviously, people do cool things with walnuts all over the country. Um, for tomatoes, for me, a lot of my creativity, um, and I think all of our creativity, is informed by stuff that I've read about, stuff that I've tasted before, stuff that I've tried cooking before, and stuff that I was taught. Right? Does everybody agree that that's where most culinary ideas come from? Every once in a while, you get zapped by a lightning bolt, and you're like, ah, what if I turn sea urchin into uh, Worcestershire sauce? Cool. That happens, but very infrequently. And a lot of that is because right now, when you look at a tomato, you can think about how it tastes and smells. But for a lot of us, we're stuck in Italy. And even if you're able to extricate yourself eventually, and you end up making like a charred tomato skin dashi that has nothing to do with Italian cooking, you, have, you started there, and you spent some gas like getting out of there. So the last thing that I want to leave with you guys um, is when I talk about x-ray vision in the kitchen, um, it's agnostic of price point or, or ethos or style. It is the ability to look at food like this, and rather than think about what you're going to do with each of these three lowercase i ingredients, it's looking at each of these things as Swiss army knives of capital I ingredients and how you can put them to work, right? So now when we look at a walnut, we're like, cool, okay, so it has a lot of carbs, a lot of proteins, and a lot of lipids. Do you know what else does? Wheat flour. Um, Gluten-free is their phrase. Um, if you have a friend coming over and you want to make gumbo, there's a lot of ways to, to thicken your gumbo that doesn't involve wheat flour. What's the point of roux in gumbo? Thicken? Yeah, make it smell nutty and brown. Brown. I, so our, our test kitchen is in Sonoma County in Northern California, just north of the Bay Area where people are investing a quarter of a billion dollars in figuring out how to make uh, mayonnaise without eggs. A quarter of a billion dollars. That's, so here, I want to put a fine point on this. It does not take a quarter of a billion dollars to figure out how something that is not egg-based can be creamy to be spread on a sandwich. It does take a 
quarter of a million dollars and probably like 90 of the world's foremost food scientists working around the clock to figure out how to make exactly an egg that hits all the right parts of your brain, behaves exactly correctly, and is indistinguishable from a real egg in it. That does take a lot of time. But oh my god, creativity is so much cheaper. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, sorry this was hurried. If uh, you'd like to dig further, there is a book online that some people call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. My name is uh, Ben Falecha. Um, I've been in the hospitality business for a very long time, a little over 20 years. And um, restaurants specifically, and there's a lot of little things that I love about restaurants. One is creating atmosphere. So Joe, to answer your question, the dimmer is broken, so we're not creating atmosphere in here. The lights are staying as they are. Um, uh, Something I, I, I think one of the, the, the main things I really love about this industry is um, the generosity of the restaurant community and what we see again and again as staff and owners try to give back. And our next uh, presenter has really raised the bar on, on that. She's the uh, co-founder of uh, Food for Soul. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Larry Gilmore. Does it show like that or can I see the whole because it looks like a PowerPoint? However, there's two, that's the video? Okay. But for the power, oh. okay, there we go. Okay, great. Here we go. Yes. Um, ready. My name is Laura Gilmore, and um, as I was introduced, I'm the business partner and wife of Massimo Bottura. We opened a restaurant uh, together in 1995, March, so just around this time. Um, you may have heard something about Austria Francescana and our bumpy road to 
Osteria, bit of a more important Osteria, dreams of Michelin stars, finally achieving those over a very long and arduous road, um, not always embraced by our town nor the entire Italian food community, um, but eventually uh, with a lot of hard work and difficulties and finding a way to communicate and share ideas with the world, we were finally able to kind of become what we are and um, not only be a restaurant that is well known, but one that is constantly trying to push the envelope, change the way people think about not only Italian food, but the fine dining experience. So, we struggled along this road for 20 years, and three years ago, something kind of unexpected happens along this road. What happens is that my husband and I decide that we're going to open, not only open, but sort of redefine, rebrand what it means to run a community kitchen, otherwise known as soup kitchen, which I hate to use that word, but if I don't use that word, nobody understands what I'm talking about. So, how did that happen? That was definitely not in the plan. That was not in the Michelin plan. That was not in the fine dining plan. That was not in the, you know, being able to win over the hearts of the Italians doing contemporary take on Italian food. Sometimes things just happen to you unexpectedly, convergence of the stars, and you take a risk, and you're going to see what's going to happen. I'd like to sort of look at that risk and what we did to understand it better, to have you understand it better, but to have me understand it better too. I'm still three years later trying to figure this out. So I call it, how do you get from A to Z? The two extremes on the alphabet and everything that falls in between. So this picture is a shot of the dining room in Austria Francescana. And if you cannot see it, you have to imagine Five tables, small room, artworks on the walls, linens, tablecloths, stuff like that. This picture, and this is a beautiful room, and it has kind of like a blue-green wall. And this picture also has kind of a greenish blue tint wall. Contemporary lighting, lovely high ceiling space. We're in London here. Um, and we didn't open a restaurant in London. But we're in London here in something called Refettorio Felix. And you can notice that the difference, biggest difference is that here we have tables for four people, two people, and here we have communal tables. So this is a project that we started, in, that we opened this summer. It's, uh, it is a soup kitchen. It's for the homeless community in um, uh, just five minute walk from Earl's Court. So we're right in um, a very important, you know, in a uh, nice neighborhood of London. We're not out in some dangerous neighborhood. And um, we are serving lunch there, and we're serving it mostly to a community of people who have mental illness, health issues, on the streets, rough sleepers, and a lot of them come there every day, five days a week. So how does this, how do these two worlds connect, and how did we even begin to think about what we're doing there? So we'll go to, we'll go to Francescana, so we can look back at what, who we are and how we can give you an idea of, of our structure to understand um, how then we repeated that for these soup kitchens. So we talk about these three different kind of a, a pyramid structure. The first is the quality of the ideas. And this is a very Italian way of saying something, the quality of the ideas. Basically, we're talking about what chefs do in the kitchen. But when we talk about what chefs do in the kitchen, I don't want to talk about only um, the quality of the ingredients, the um, farm to table, the freshest, you know. In Italy, where everything is based on artisanal and nostalgic, and your grandmother's recipes, and the way the tomato looks, as he was saying, or the tomato all of a sudden you associate it with, you know, the basil next to it, and you get all these pictures in your mind. Well, Italians live like that all the time. It's always these pictures and these dreams and these nostalgic things, and you can get lost in that in a country like Italy and lose the sense that actually making a recipe and cooking 
it's an intellectual act. It's not just about nostalgia and pictures and beautiful memories of your childhood. So um, the quality of the ideas is that at Franciscana. The German artist Kandinsky, um, when he talked about art, he, he also used a pyramid. And for him, the pyramid, the very top of the pyramid is the idea. What something comes into your unique brain about something, the landscape, the light. We were just at the Barnes Museum earlier, and my brain is exploding from all the things I saw. So there at the top of the pyramid, you've got this idea. And as you go down the pyramid, in the middle, to the left and the right, you have technique on one side. It could be your culinary technique. It could be what you learned as a kid, whatever technique it is that you use to make your art or make your food. And the other side, your cultural baggage. Everything that you bring to that, what you've read, what you learned, what your grandmother told you, when you scraped your knee, everything. That comes together, your technique, your cultural baggage, your idea on the top. And at the bottom, you have your materials. You have your ingredients. And together, those are your, that's your basics for creating a recipe. So at Austria Francescana, quality of ideas is about chefs working together, thinking together, experimenting, evolving their ideas, their palates, and their techniques. Cooking is a matter of mindfulness. We ask questions in, in, our, in our kitchen. What's the potential of a potato? How do I use intuition to create these edible bites? What technique do I need to sublime a snail? Questions, questions, questions. And asking the right questions of our ingredients and ourselves and our traditions, we arrive at our recipes. Second, and this is a re you can't see anything here. So there's, um, this is part of Francescana in our entranceway. It's already changed because we're always changing the artwork. Second pillar for us is power of beauty. Power of beauty, um, I'm not talking about beautiful draperies necessarily or a beautiful uh, candle on your table. I'm talking about beauty in a much bigger sense of ideas and artwork and design and how the way the light falls on a table can change your experience of, uh, of a meal. Because we know that a meal is not just what you eat, but how you eat it, the context you're in, the light that's falling on whatever you're eating, or your companion's face, the way someone is talking to you, power of beauty. So a small example in the entranceway of Francescana, there's Frankie. Frankie's in the corner. And he is our security guard. It's a Dwayne Hansen sculpture from 1979. And I fell in love with um, art probably when I saw this Dwayne Hansen show was one of the first art shows my parents took me to at the Whitney Museum. And all of a sudden, from being a regular kid, I saw the world in a different way. I saw it from upside down, because Dwayne Hansen was doing, if anybody knows his work, these lifelike sculptures that look like a security guard standing in the corner. And Frankie's a great example, because he's kind of not really looking at you. He's got scuffy shoes. He's got an Omega watch. He's so perfectly real that guests in the Franciscana ask him where the bathroom is. And I love that, because that's art that's actually interacting with you and making you think about, is the world really what it looks like? And are things really what they seem? And maybe we have to question everything. So Frankie keeps us honest. He's our security guard. But he also keeps everybody questioning, is the world really what it looks like? On the corner here is a piece by Michelangelo Pistoletto, this little mirror. And you can't see it very well, but the mirror has an image of a pigeon. So the pigeon is there, and we have some other pigeons in our restaurant by an artist called Maurizio Catalan. And people think that's really, really weird. One time on uh, TripAdvisor, uh, there was this comment that said, I think the architect ran out of ideas and decided to put pigeons in the corner of the hallway or something. And I was like, I love that. That's so cool. So the pigeon, nobody likes pigeons. Pigeons are like so, you know, they're, they're, nobody wants to talk about pigeons. But artists like pigeons, because pigeons are part of our culture and our, and our constant conflict between nature and society. We got to live with these birds. And they're annoying, and they you know, make messes, and they're, they're there. Then you take them to Venice, and like everybody wants their picture with a pigeon. So it's like this very curious thing about pigeons. So we also have this thing. The pigeon, once again, it's asking questions about art and nature and society and how we integrate those, um, those things. We also have pigeon on the menu. Massimo likes to play with the idea that you could actually hunt a pigeon. So um, artwork for us in the restaurant serves as kind of a trail of breadcrumbs. It's uh, little keys, little clues to help you understand, as a diner, 
Number one, when you walk in, that this is probably not a traditional osteria. Number two, that if you want to look around the room and no one is describing the artwork, like in the Barnes Museum today, the amazing thing was there's no sort of titles or they're not telling you what the artwork is. You actually have to just kind of start looking yourself and making connections. So these visual clues, we don't have a landscape outside the windows, we don't have a church, we don't see you know, beautiful mountains or trees. We see art, and art has become the landscape of our ideas. When I came to Austria Francescana from New York, I was working in the art world. I thought I was going to have to leave everything behind and start this whole new business and this whole new life. And what happens, I contaminated everything. I contaminated my husband, number one, and then the restaurant itself, and the art and the ideas slipped in the back of the kitchen, and they started changing the way those guys cooked. So the third thing that is our pillar of our restaurant is the value of hospitality. Value of hospitality, um, sorry, I lost my picture, um, is really the storytelling that goes on. It's, if we have, today, everyone talks about chefs. Oh, the chefs on television, and the master chef, and this chef, you want to be a chef, blah, blah, blah. We're losing sight of hospitality. Hospitality is everything to a restaurant. We can't have an army of chefs and nobody to serve people. And not just serve them, here's, you know, the chefs, there are lots of cool restaurants where the chefs come out and they tell your story and the whole thing. Number one, you have to have like so many chefs in the kitchen to have them be able to serve as well. <laughs> that means you have stagers and the country like Italy is way too, um, way too communist to have people working for free. So we are allowed like four, three a year, I mean a season. Um, but the other thing about hospitality is that it's another job. People and people who are good at hospitality, it's not just smiling. In Italy, there's no tip system, so it's not about I'm going to be so funny and describe the plate and so you're going to give me a better tip. It's really about serving someone in a way that's so invisible and so magical. It has its own dance. It becomes a part of the experience itself. Our, our servers weaving in and out, occasionally telling you something about a dish, inviting you to engage with them in the storytelling, to feel that you are not only a guest in that restaurant, eating food, but that you are part of something that could be a theater experience, that could, it's a movable feast. You're not quite sure what's gonna happen next. Um, so hospitality is very, very important to us and something that we more and more in the restaurant business, whether it is a fine dining restaurant, casual, pizzeria, you only notice hospitality and service when it's not going right. When your waitress isn't showing up, when you, you want to get the bill and there's nobody around and she's you know, standing on the corner like talking with her friends. Hospitality is that invisible thing that makes you feel good in a restaurant, sitting at a table, and you could stay for hours. Those are the three sort of structures around Francescana and how we consider our restaurant and how we work on this all the time. We learned something along our path of trying to develop a uh, contemporary Italian cutting edge uh, restaurant. Um, and we learned this kind of the hard way, but we learned it in, in an interesting way. Um, can a restaurant be a gesture of solidarity? Or a recipe. Can a recipe be a gesture of solidarity? My husband would translate that into, can a restaurant be a social gesture? Um, which sounds great in Italian, but in English, not quite. A social gesture. What does that mean? So we, at the moment in your career in, as, a, as a chef in a restaurant, when you recognize that a good part of what you do is based on the ingredients you have in your hands and the people who make them, the availability of those ingredients, the quality of those ingredients, the artisans who are able to produce them and survive on, on that job alone, is when you start really reflecting on how you can not only support them, but fight for them, you know, be close to them in their time of need, and you become sensitized to the fact that you, as a restaurant, as a chef, are not just there to express your own ideas and promote them to the world, but you're also there to fight for others, and that you can 
have an effect on a larger community by what you do. So um, this, this point was <coughs> developed slowly in our restaurant, but it really came across in 2012 when there was an earthquake. 2012, there was an earthquake in Modena, in the area of Emilia Romagna, and um, you know, church towers came down, and modern factories were destroyed, and there was the landscape was the beautiful landscape of all those farmhouses crumbled, and lots and lots of Parmesan cheese that was sitting on these these the, the, they're stored in warehouses on these long um, wood boards. We'd never had an earthquake like that in Emilia Romagna, maybe in like 1475. All of them came crashing down. So a wheel of cheese, which is an enormous thing. Once it's broken, the seal, that sort of, in, the, the seal of, um, that's formed with the salt, it can no longer be aged. And Parmesan, to be able to be Parmesan, needs to be aged for 24 months. Some people age it even longer. So all these wheels of cheese, 350,000 wheels of cheese were damaged. That's a lot of cheese. And so the consortium of Parmigiano Reggiano said, we don't want our cheesemakers to lose all the money they've invested because they you know, milk the cows like a year and a half earlier and they have their warehouses with the cheese sitting there. So they came and they started talking to people and they asked Massimo, they said, can you help us? Can you help us talk about this problem and let the world know that all these wheels of cheese have been damaged and promote the sale of Parmesan cheese? Because if people buy cheese, then those warehouses are going to have enough money to continue their, their business. And so we came up with a recipe. Massimo came up with a recipe. And it's called riso cacio pepe. And cacio pepe is traditionally a recipe that you would make with spaghetti. It's not Modenese or Emiliano at all. It's Roman. But there was this idea of rice as a conduit. Rice is something that gives hope. Rice is something that's almost a universal food. Um, it looks totally white. It's like a white on white. So there's this idea of a blank canvas where you can then invent anything. The rice is cooked in this dashi that Massimo makes out of, that the kitchen makes out of grated Parmesan cheese. And to make a dashi out of Parmesan cheese, you really need lots and lots and lots of grated cheese. So we're not just putting the grated cheese on top of the, of the, of the risotto. It's in the flavor is deeply embedded in the rice. So it looks invisible, looks like white rice, and yet it tastes like cheese. And what we did is with Slow Food is we had this virtual dinner. The virtual dinner went on to um, communicate all over the world the recipe and encourage people to make this food. No cheesemaker lost their job. No dairy farm was closed. And we learned that a recipe can be a social gesture, an act of solidarity, and then cooking is a call to act. Every moment that you rate a recipe, every moment that you are cooking, that you're talking about, what you do, it is a call to act. So with that came along 2015. 2015, three years ago, is when this crazy idea happened. And um, the crazy idea happened in, um, in this moment when Italy was starting to talk about Expo. So Expo was in 2015, but people were starting to talk about it and polemicize about it in 2013. And the theme came out. The theme was feed the planet. Feed the planet. So of course it was going to be about food. Countries from all over the world were going to have their chefs come and they were going to cook and their pavilions were going to be about food culture and food futures and sustainability and all. You could just already see it. Feed the planet. And Massimo and I thought, feed the planet? Well, that's like a seriously daunting task. I mean, we are a lemonade stand. We do lunch and dinner five days a week. We have 12 tables. You know, do the numbers. We're not doing big numbers. How can we even address the idea of Feed the Planet? Who are we to, to even discuss that, to add to the dialogue? And yet people were calling us. They were saying, will you come and do a pop-up here? Will you cook in our you know, sponsors and cook in our restaurant or come to the fairgrounds? And there was all this sort of like, hey, I don't, are we going to do that? And then one morning Massimo came, and it was like a Sunday morning, and he said to me, I've got a really great idea. And when he says that, I'm like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> Let me sit down and think about, like, okay, I have to sit down. What's the idea? We're going to open a soup kitchen. We're going to open a soup kitchen. We're going to cook with the waste of Expo. And I'm going to invite all my friends, chefs from around the world to do the cooking. And I thought, oh my god, this sounds like a terrible idea, Massimo. <laughs> this is not going to work. This is going to be a disaster. This, the, press is going to be at us. 
Everyone is going to be on our tail. Can't we just stick to doing what we always do? Look, we've come so far. We've worked so hard. We got our three Michelin star. We have literally like, just gotten it. I'm like, well, it's going to be a mess. That's what we did. That's what we did. We decided to feed the planet in our own way. And we decided to basically create a kind of a chef's pavilion in Expo, not in the fairground, but actually in the city of Milan, in a neighborhood that wasn't really um, a great neighborhood. It wasn't a terrible neighborhood, but it was like an old working class neighborhood. And one of the most interesting things about this neighborhood is where it's where all the trains kind of converge. And then you can't get out of that neighborhood. You have to go under the bridges. So you're stuck. There's an old church there from the 15th century, and next to this church was a theater that had been abandoned for 25 years. So we worked with the um, Catholic charity, Caritas, to find this space. And we had to knock on the doors of basically the, the, the Vatican to be able to collaborate with them to, to, for them to give us this space or to, to use this space. But the amazing thing about that space was that you were Trains passing all the time, it's like life passing and, and, and the future running by. And we thought if we can create something that has lasting value in a neighborhood that nobody's talking about, it's a working class neighborhood, lots of immigrants, two or three different um, homeless shelters around there, if we can do something there, then we can do it anywhere. So numbers are numbers. Every year, one third of the food we produce goes into the landfill. Almost one billion people around the world are undernourished. And recently I just read that 3.4 trillion apples are wasted globally every year. Apples, apples are not bananas. They're like really, really easy. Not, they don't, they, they, they last forever. So with those numbers and with that idea, we decided to open this soup kitchen. And we saw this expo and this window of opportunity to talk about food waste, but also to talk about social um, isolation and social inclusion. And the fact that, you know, at that time we were getting so many immigrants and so many refugees coming through Italy, and there was this kind of craziness, no one knew how to deal with it. A lot of homeless people, but homeless, not homeless people who are, in London we found homeless people who were kind of chronically homeless. These are people who maybe had a job a year ago and lost their job, and. Just that cycle, you know, things got worse and worse and worse, people passing through a very fragile moment in their lives. And so we decided that we would apply all those structures of Austria Francescana, what we knew how to do, what we'd learned to do, to the soup kitchen. So we were going to bring in the quality of ideas, the power of beauty, and the art of hospitality. Basically what we did is we prepared meals with food waste, surplus coming from supermarkets, Ingredients close to expiration dates, brown bananas, bruised apples, everything that was really headed for the dumpster. And we invited chefs from around the world to transform these ugly and pretty ordinary ingredients into delicious meals. What we did is we replaced that sort of soup kitchen lineup with a beautiful dining room. Each table has been designed by a different Italian uh, designer. So Patricia Archiola, who has a show right now at the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art, she designed this beautiful table, and Fabio Novembro and Alessandro Mendini, and these are like, you know, the geniuses of the design world. Each one made a different frattino table. There's artworks, there's a Gaetano Pesce fountain there in the back. You can't tell, it looks like it's made of Play-Doh. He's very playful. And then there's this painting, which is a piece of bread on a really simple aluminum kind of table, tablecloth on top, talks about the power of food. There's a mural over there. So, in addition to that, we decided instead of setting up that self-service, I'm going to come in, I'm by myself, I'm a homeless person, I'm going to go pick up my food, that we would sit everyone down at the table, they could sit wherever they wanted to, and we would serve them a three-course meal. Because part of this idea was that there's a, very, there's a power to the meal. There's a power to sitting down at a table and being with people front to front, no one was on the end of the table, looking at the person in front of you, and that being an invitation to talk and also the first step to any kind of rehabilitation. That food is not just the calories, the deliciousness, the presentation, but it's how we eat it. I don't know where that picture came from. 
Oh, there's a video. Yes. Okay. Here we go. I can do this. video. Sorry I use a Mac and so I'm really in difficulty here. I, I don't know how to get out of this. I'm sorry about that. Let's escape. Escape. Okay. Got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So this is a short film talks about what we did after we opened the first soup kitchen in Milan um, and why we founded Food for Soul. Go. Food for Soul is a non-profit organization founded by Chef Massimo Bottura and Lara Gilman. Food for Soul works together with communities so they can fight against food waste through social inclusion. We believe that we're not a charity. We're a cultural project because we want to change the mindset of people, not only regarding food waste and what food waste is. We can use that resource to transform it. And how do we do that? It's to connect in different dots. So one of these dots is chefs. We invite chefs to collaborate in our projects to come one day and cook together with the staff with our stuff in different projects um, in order to create new recipes, new ways of addressing these ingredients, of seeing them. I think the most important message of uh, this project is involving the chef, their creativity, their time, and uh, their knowledge. Because fighting waste, you need experience, you need people, chefs, they're like taking these ordinary ingredients and create extraordinary meals. We go uh, and speak with designers and architects and artists that transform the spaces to be functional but also beautiful. Um, and we don't think this is something shallow, but uh, through all our projects we have experienced how this can have a big impact in people's life um, and the value that they see that the society are given to them. A warm and comfortable place for the homeless and good design is incredibly smart and one that we were definitely keen to be involved with. First and foremost, we wanted to make a place where people would feel comfortable and cared for. Volunteers serve at a table. We believe that the value of the hospitality can change also um, the way we uh, relate to the others. And a lot of that is with people in need. Um, so instead of having a wall or, or a glass and serving someone through that, we go to the tables, volunteers serve at the tables and say to someone, hi, how was your day? Uh, and even recognize it by name. The fact of being recognized and, and having human contact through hospitality um, comes a lot from the idea of Osteria Francescana, which Massimo and Lara founded more than 20 years ago. Allora, questo luogo deve essere, deve diventare un luogo di cultura. L'accoglienza si fa cultura. E la cultura dove al primo posto ci sta l'attenzione al povero, al primo posto ci sta l'inclusione sociale del popolo. Do we need another soup kitchen? No. But we need a, a space that changes the perspective of the whole uh, area, where it is, where it is located, uh, through his incredible positive message of inclusion. In a world in which they build walls, we break walls and we say, welcome, come here. So that's how we rebuild the dignity of the people. So that's our nonprofit, Food for Song, which we started. Yay! I will be able to do this. Yeah, did it. Okay. Full screen. Is that the one on the bottom? No. So 
sorry, I just don't use those. So, going quickly through, quality of ideas, chefs, once again, bringing chefs together from different parts of the world, local chefs, uh, international chefs, visiting chefs. We found that by inviting chefs into the, um, into the soup kitchens, we were passing on knowledge. It was a way for the staff who work there to get new ideas. You're working with food surplus, so you never know what, from one day to the next, what food, what you're going to have. So you, one day you could get like, an unbelievable amount of beautiful chickens. And then you might have your regular chicken recipe, but the chef comes along and says, hey, we could do something incredible with this chicken. We can, we can like, make it taste so delicious. Um, that's the Giorgio Locatelli, who was in um, a really fun Italian chef who lives in London. Uh, this is some of the food, food, food surplus coming in, some of the dishes that were made. Um, you know, it's just that there's, by working with chefs, it's a way of not only creating new recipes, but passing on knowledge, sharing recipes, and helping reduce food waste through recognizing that most of the food that's being thrown away from supermarkets is perfectly edible, probably still pretty good tasting, and with a little bit of technique, experience, knowledge, you can turn it into something actually quite delicious. Um, there's a funny story when we were in Rio, so we opened Milan in 2015, and these soup kittens are not pop-ups, they're running five days a week, um, every day, I mean every, you know, all the time, and then uh, in Rio during the Olympics we were able to open one 2016, that was very challenging because Rio is a challenging place to be, and then last summer uh, in London, and Rio was unbelievable. We were, it was the day we were opening. We had no idea what we were going to be cooking. None of the food sur surplus had come in. I had brought some pasta in my suitcase. We had a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Someone had donated, said they were donating pancetta, and we got this, like, this big a piece for, I don't know, 100 people. So the only thing that was around were all these bananas, bananas everywhere, just brown bananas, bananas, like piles of bananas. And I, I knew that we'd be in the tropics and there'd be bananas, but I had no idea how many bananas there were going to be. So obvious there was going to be a banana dessert. What were we going to serve? Massimo looked at what we had available, and in an instant he said, I've got an idea. Let's peel the, let's put the bananas aside, let's keep the peels. He had learned from a... Brazilian chef who had come to Milan the year before that you can make banana peel chutney. So I said, why don't we take the banana peels and we'll smoke them with the pancetta that we have. So you have a tiny piece of pancetta for 150 people. You're going to divide it up in lots of pieces. You put it under a, in a large vat and the oven wasn't working, so we had to smoke it outside, make a little fire. And, you know, it's real. You can do that kind of stuff. You can go outside and make a fire and smoke stuff. So chopped it up, and the flavor of the banana peels, it, all the pancetta was absorbed, and so we made a carbonara, and nobody noticed the difference. So that's the quality of ideas. That's saying you can make a smoked banana peel carbonara because you're creative, you have experience, and you sort of risk everything. Power of beauty. Massimo looking at one of the photographs in the Repertorio Milan. Uh, JR, who's an artist who's done a lot of very interesting street art. I don't know if anybody saw the work that he did. Put a big poster on the wall between Mexico and the United States. Huge poster, photograph of a little boy. It looks like, from the United States side, it looks like he's peering over the wall. So he decided to um, put his uh, large, lifelike uh, uh, photographs in the Refectorio in Rio. And instead of photographing famous chefs, he photographed culinary students. Culinary students were in a program, Gastromotiva, to help them get out of the, um, out of the um, favelas. And this was a message, art saying that you are the next, you are the future, the next generation of chefs. And then the walls being painted by Ilse Crawford in London. Here we are with hospitality. So the idea that folding napkins and serving napkins in a soup kitchen Sounds crazy. Yeah, it totally sounds crazy. These napkins happen to be made by a group of uh, Syrian uh, refugees in London, and it's giving women work. We have our volunteers. We fold them. We wash them. It's all part of that idea of making someone feel welcome and at home when they're at their darkest and most vulnerable hour. 
lovely people serving at the table and the energy that that creates. So we have quality of ideas, power of beauty, hospitality, but there's one thing missing. And I think this is something that's missing in general when I look out at the, at the, at the restaurant industry and, and what's happening, and that's the unexpected. So in this image, there's Massimo, my husband, chef. Next to him is a chef named Elaine Ducasse. Elaine Ducasse was my husband's kind of mentor. And when I met Massimo in 1993, all he would talk about was Elaine Ducasse. And Elaine Ducasse at the time had all these Michelin stars, and he was renovating the whole French cuisine and making it Mediterranean. Massimo then went on to um, cook with Elaine Ducasse, and they'd become friends. They're not, neither of them are in their restaurants. They're in the soup kitchen. And Ducasse was there that day. And they're playing cards with one of the guests, who is a homeless person who happens to be a magician. <laughs> this is a moment, this image remind, just reminds me of how important the unexpected is. To embrace it, to not be afraid. When you have that terrible idea, that scary idea, see it through to its final hour, risk everything, go out on a limb, because ironically, that's the moment when things happen, when you see the world in a different way. So hard work, humility, years of sacrifice are all very important to get anywhere in life. But if you don't leave a space open for the unexpected, I wouldn't be here, and neither would these soup kitchens. The unexpected is the power to create the world you imagine, not the one you see, nor the one you're given. So A to Z. We're not cooking for a small number of people in these soup kitchens, we're cooking for a lot of people. So here was one dinner that we did, and um, this is about capacity and expanding. And Thursday, we're opening a soup kitchen in Paris. I didn't think that this, not any of this would happen. I didn't think we'd get this far. I thought that Expo would be an idea and that would end there. But we realized through trying to address the issue of food waste and social inclusion that there's a much wider community to be touched upon and, and more that we can do. Not only can you really get the energy of people who want to be in the food industry, but maybe they have another job. People who want to be a chef or want to be a volunteer can come and work at these soup kitchens and they can feel part of something. And it's not just about doing a good deed. It actually, you make friends and you have fun and you meet chefs. And so you, 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 you create that whole atmosphere. 20 years ago, nobody cared about what chefs had to say. And now, look how that has changed. So we all have a voice, and we can make change happen. When Rene Rizzepi came to cook at the Repertorio Milan, he said to Massimo, you know you're in this for life. <laughs> and Massimo really didn't get it. He really didn't hear it. But there we are, and we're opening Thursday. JR is doing the artwork. Elaine Ducasse is going to be opening with a rival chef of his, Yannick Alano. They're coming together. It's a going to be like a historical compromise for all of Paris and the mayor. <laughs> and the cool thing is that we're doing this in the basement of one of the most iconic spaces in Paris, which is the Madeleine. So in the crypt of the Madeleine, we've created a space that will be a soup kitchen in the heart of Paris for those in need. Our communities and our world are facing great issues. Problems of food waste and social isolation, don't get solved by themselves. The power of the meal is real. Through food, beauty, hospitality, we can affect change. So I say, in this room, there are enough people, amazing people, to make a difference. Be bold, be brave, be daring, make mistakes, take chances, and show you care. Do something. Whether you're a fine dining restaurant, a community kitchen, a taco shop, whether you're a teacher, artisan, a baker, an engineer, or someone who cares, remember that cooking, like life, is a call to act. Thank you.
tirelessly investigated and wrote the John Besh expose for the New Orleans Times Picune. Brett understands the responsibility he holds as a food critic and promotes transparency within the industry. Together, they are laying the foundation to create an industry that upholds a zero tolerance policy for misconduct. This foundation is crucial for the next generation of culinary and hospitality professionals, professionals like myself. It is my honor to introduce restaurateur and food writer Jen Egg and food writer Brett Anderson. That was very nice. It made me very uncomfortable, but very nice. Also, I, I should point out that I'm also like a lot of fun, too. <laughs> where I meet all my best friends. Um, and I've been aware of who Jen is as a restaurateur and writer for many years. I have not myself been as wrong um, But this past spring, I was in New Orleans at a, at a po' boy shop in May. And I ran into two people who were in the restaurant industry when I was there. And as it happened, I had just, I was either just meeting for Montreal or I had just got back from Montreal. And, and that entered into the sort of small bar. And consequence of that piece of information, and one of these people said, oh, you know, you need to read this book by Jen Ed. And the, and that's sort of what caused the book to, to, to I knew of her book, but to, to rise to the top of the sack of things I was going to read. It was interesting that apparently in the minds of these New Orleanians that Toronto and Montreal are two neighborhoods in a town called Canada. <laughs> but, um, but I did, uh, it did trigger me to read this book. And the um, book's very triggering as well. It is very triggering. <laughs> and as it happened in May, I was four months into report into working on an investigation that turned out to be an eight-month investigation into allegations of sexual harassment at a restaurant company owned by a very well-known chef in New Orleans named John Bash. And at this point that I was reading Jen's book, which is about a lot of things, it's not just about sexual harassment in the workplace, but it, it I'll explain in a second. Um, at the point I was reading this book, I was at a point in my re reporting where I wasn't really sure if the time I had spent on it was going to warrant spending more time on it. I was still a couple of months away from um, getting my hands on an a EEOC complaint filed by a former uh, employee and a subordinate of John Bash who had claimed that the sexual relationship she had with him wasn't consensual. The, I had a lot of reporting and I talked with a lot of women at this point, but this was before Me Too, this was before Harvey Weinstein, and I'm just being honest about sort of where my head was as a reporter. I thought a lot about, you know, these complaints that these women are telling me, they're not the kinds of things I've read in the newspaper before when I've read about sexual harassment. And I was concerned that, my biggest concern was that at that point in my reporting is if I had gone with a story then, that the public's response would be to yawn. And that that would have had a very adverse impact on the industry itself. It would have caused people to not come forward with the sorts of complaints they were sharing with me at that time. That was the thing that worried me the most. It's probably true. And then I read Jen's book, and I and I and I want to read just a little, just a little passage of this, and then I'm going to start asking Jen questions. Oh, it's not even on. Sorry. Is mine on? Yes. What a beautiful voice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so now I'm probably too loud, but so in this part of the book, um, Jen is just describing a relationship she had with, a, with her then partner, who was a man named Grant. And, uh, and it's just one of many instances in which she's describing what it's like to work together and what it's like. What it's like. <laughs> um, to get anywhere with any decision, I'd have to have the kind of winding conversation that left, left him feeling whatever small thing I wanted was somehow his idea and left me feeling exhausted. 
like the time we disagreed about how a server had handled something. She had correctly responded to a customer's request to bring the food all at once. It was only three items, but Grant flipped out when she, when she put in the order, saying that that's not how the kitchen does things and she would have to course it out. Um, Jen goes on to say that, you know, this is, she sort of understood Grant and whatever, but um, the, 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 she, she, she's someone who, okay, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read what she said. Um, I understand wanting to present each, by a lawyer, that's all. I understand wanting to present each dish on its own. It's better dining experience, but in this case, the customer was in a hurry and just wanted to have it all at once. So what's the big deal? But Grant wouldn't relent, relent and forced the server to course it out. She ended up picking up each course as she dropped the previous one off, which was a ridiculous waste of time. Also, Grant could prove a point that wasn't even worth squabbling over, leaving the customer unhappy. Ironically, I'd usually be, I'd usually be the more likely to, of us to put forth an attitude of this is how we do things, but I would always try to accommodate easily dealt with requests about food. This is often a point of contention between the front and the back of the house, but ought not to be because it's mostly a way for the often men in a kitchen to puff their chests and show who's boss. The server ended up in tears. I ended up trying to mediate. The worst part about looking back on this time is how complicit I was in this negative atmosphere. I wanted an equal partnership and a pleasant environment. This was challenging enough to achieve with the external pressures of a dining public holding our casual restaurant to extremely high expectations, but it was made extra difficult by the necessity of negotiating a minefield of negativity, ranging from sullen silence to whispered rage. The day following a particular black service, Grant's would be, Grant would be all smiles and jokes, as though none of it had happened. But what even was it? And I always remember reading that line. You know, this is, a, not, a, this is not a Weinstein in a crazy hotel room scenario that she's describing. But I had been reporting, sort of in the back of my mind, believing that the standard for behavior that would be newsworthy had to be violent that it had to be something that was coercive. And while ultimately my reporting did unearth like, accusations that were those things, this really turned a switch for me as a reporter where I was like, the standard shouldn't be what the standard has been for the past in newsrooms. The standard should be if, the behavior, if any reasonable people can believe the behavior described is fucked up, then I should put in the energy to try to verify the behavior. And I don't know if I would have done it if I hadn't read this. Well, that's lovely. I mean, I can't tell you how uncomfortable it is to have my terrible writing read to me. Um, <laughs> but that's really awesome. There's, well, that, there's that sort of thing that I talk about this a lot, um, about how my worry, especially in Canada where we haven't had as much stuff coming out, my worry is that somebody's not rapey enough to be brought down. Mm -hmm. You know, like the standard, sorry, I think I'm going to just ruin everything. The standard is, um, the standard is, you know, is so high, a, a, for the police to believe you. I mean, the whole process is, is mm -hmm. insane, like from going through it to reporting it to going to trial. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my worry in the industry is that there's, there's this, there, there are all these monsters doing these monstrous things, but they're not that kind of monster. Which is, a, which is another whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I get, I get that a lot in the aftermath of the story that I reported in our market where people will say, well, he wasn't Harvey Weinstein. Right. And it's like, well, that's not the bar. And, <laughs> yeah. um, the, um, the bar. But I'm curious, Jen, what, you know, when, I, when you wrote that part of your book, which, it, you know, all of this was well before the Me Too movement that you're, you were writing and, and put this book out, did you have a sense that you were particularly when you were describing these sort of instances of negativity, of abuse in, 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 in the workplace, that you were involved in truth telling, that you were involved in something like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring some sunlight here where it's never been. Did that ever cross your mind? No, I'm too self-absorbed for that. Um, it was just like... Couldn't you be both? <laughs> yeah. <sure. laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. Okay, we're just going to put this on the table. Um, also, I ordered a rum and coke like 45 minutes ago. Um, so, uh, no, you know, I, I, think, I think the whole thing was I want to tell my story. And, and, and if those themes were going to be sort of, you know, I couldn't, it, the timing was very fortunate mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, but that's a very trite gross way to look at it. You know, it's... You said, 
by fortunate, do you mean that you feel as if your book has gotten a bigger bounce <laughs> uh, because it came out when it did? Probably. But I'm sure that that's true in some ways. I mean, nobody, nobody cared about any of this stuff for you know, my whole life until now it's starting to feel like there's this global connectivity, which is a really beautiful and inspiring thing to be a part of. And I think most women feel that. Feel that sort of your, your hair stand on end when you start to talk about it or you start to, to think that there's actually, you know, the waves aren't going to keep washing out, that they're going to land and they're going to, you know, we're going we're gonna to catch them and hold on to this moment. And I, I think I just mixed like four metaphors. But, you know, that, that, that we actually have a shot. And, and I've never felt that ever in my life before. And I've been this like, you know, loudmouth asshole for a long time. And, and to now have people sort of who dismissed me, and I mean, this is just like petty. Are you talking about being a loud ass asshole about this stuff? About everything, you know, but yeah, but certainly about this stuff and about how the, how the industry is. I've been talking mm -hmm. about it for decades, um, and particularly for the last decade. Um, and to have people who spend a lot of time either distancing themselves from me or dismissing me altogether come crawling back feels great. Hmm. You know? Can you talk a little bit more specifically about how when you talked about issues of misogyny and in the restaurant business in years past, what happened? You know, like what, where did that conversation go? Well, it's sort of hard because I already kind of built a bubble for myself and I built a world where I could exist and talk about these things and be surrounded by not idiots. And that was like a conscious choice because um, there's not, like there's a lot of people in the restaurant industry that are not super geniuses. This is a fact of our industry. And so there's already this, this strange bar. You're probably not supposed to stay, say stuff like that, but you know, it's true. Too it's late. really true. Um, and, and so I'd already kind of constructed this world where I, I felt safe, I guess is the best way to put it. But, you know, getting, this is the first like big conference I've been invited to. Mm -hmm. I'm 42, I'm not an ingenue. I've been doing this the same amount of time as the Joe Beef guys and they've been going to conferences for like a decade. Mm -hmm. They're, I mean, my Canadian-ness obviously has something to do with it, but it's a thing. <coughs> You know, people are, and so now we're, I'm having my own sort of personal crisis of ask me about empire building. Like, can someone ask me hmm. for an opinion that isn't about sexual harassment? That would be great. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 there's a lot <laughs> Although, to be angry about. <laughs> like, no shortage of things to be angry about. You mentioned the, uh, you know, this interconnectivity between women, um, sort of regardless of geography. Um, and how there's an, uh, uh, an opportunity now uh, because of the moment we're living through. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you think the opportunity looks like in practice? Like what is it that, that if, if you were the puppet master of every person who ran a restaurant, what would be the response, you know, that everyone should be it's such taking? A, that's such a great question because, you know, I was just talking about that with, with Helen. We were just talking about like what is it we want people to do? Um, so when, okay, so I'm going to give a really long-winded tangential answer because that's how my brain works, but first of all, um, there's a very obvious right side of this, right? Like it's clear we can all see the right side of this, but fewer than five big-time, well-known male restaurateurs are choosing to, to be on it publicly, which is crazy to me when it's like it's so clear. Second, if that starts to expand. And by that you mean make their issue, make this their issue? Well, no, Is just talk like about it at all. Literally talk about it at all. Retweet a story, like bare minimum shit here. Mm -hmm. Like write an article for food and wine, like something, you know, nothing really. Mm -hmm. And there's only about five people doing it that are men. And, and, and then the next thing, let's say that starts to, you know, ripple outward, which, you know, we're hoping that that's what's going to happen. It's a public-facing industry. We're in the hospitality business. So the very nature is to be tricking people into having a good time. So how are you supposed to know when somebody, it's, it's complicated by that is what I'm trying to say, is you know, um, when a restaurateur, for example, uh, Danny Meyer, uh, builds his entire reputation on the idea of 
giving a shit about his staff. Like that is a tenet of his philosophy, um, along with you know wonderful service for all. How much of that is real? How much of it is marketing? I mean, that's something to untangle, and it looks like there's a problem there, mm -hmm. um, which is so unsurprising to me. Like none of this stuff ever surprises me. Um, there was a story I saw in Eater. Is it what yeah, that's, that's what about, I, that's why I feel some complaints his company, shit just in case not everyone knew that. Yeah, who everyone loves so much. Um, so no one's recording this. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So there's that. So then, okay. So then, let's say we start to see people doing the things that we want them to do. You're free to leave at any time. Um, I'm just kidding, you guys. It's not a Simpsons episode. Um, so. You know, let, let's say they start performing as like allies, as good guys, as whatever it is we want them to do. How much of that do they have to do before we forgive them their trespasses? What is the, what's the restitution process here? Um, is going to a beach and collecting $200 every time you, you pass go, $200,000 every time you pass go, is that reasonable because you're not in your restaurant? Like, th this is all such new territory. And I, I'm trying to work out what I think is appropriate because I feel like I maybe get to sort of help shape the dialogue here because I've been talking about it for so long. You know, not that I get to like police it, but like put those ideas out there. And, I, but I don't know either. And it's all I think about. I mean, I, I get the sense that, you know, we're, we're uh, what, seven months, six months since the Harvey Weinstein stuff came out in the uh, you know, the restaurant stuff came out a couple weeks after that. What we know about what the consequence is for bad behavior here is that you get the spotlight taken off you, basically, right? That's, that's the, that seems to be all we really know for sure, um, that you lose your Probably TV shows. Probably temporarily. I mean, America loves Yeah, we don't, you know, it's story. only a few months, but I'm just trying to sort of talk through, yeah. like, th we know that that happens, and... The restaurants are still busy. I would almost guarantee it. This is. I mean, I know the John Besh's restaurants for, certainly are. For yeah. Sure. I mean, the, and um, certainly Vitali's are. And so, what it, you know? Do, do you think about what a more severe consequence ought to be for people who you, it ought to be in the in the in that you could conceivably come make come to pass for men who own their own companies and are essentially their own bosses. And so it's like they're in these positions of sort of disciplining themselves. And, you know, I mean, this is something I kind of struggle with because people bring it up with me and it's like, I don't know, if I mean, I'm not the cops. And, I, but I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that bad. Yeah, frankly. no, I agree, I agree. <laughs> you know, to, like, it doesn't seem like they're be, losing you know, that just much. Just because you don't get to be on TV is not, I don't, you know, Although that was a privilege to begin with. That's like take, okay, no more champagne I think it's probably really hard. I think it's probably really hard for them. I mean, so. I'm, but I don't, I don't want to be in a position to be thinking about empathizing with monsters just yet because I don't think we've had a good, like, swim in anger. You know, I really want to hang out in anger for a little while before, <laughs> before we get to, like, and, but that doesn't mean that I don't think that men should be part of this conversation, which is a, mm -hmm. a thing that, you know, we talk, we talk about a lot. Um, and I don't think that we're going to get anywhere without the support of powerful white men. That in your book, you talk about this phenomenon that I've thought about a lot um, that, that makes me a pessimist, you know, in, in some ways about, about how quickly change is going to come to pass. And that has to do with, you know, you, you talk in some, at some length about the tradition of the restaurant kitchen stemming from Europe where you had these abusive, the abusive by design, <laughs> right. you know, cultures. And that you have generations now of men, mostly, who have been brought up and, 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 and told that this is what it means to be a professional. You know, this is, this is what I have. Oh, they crave it. This you is know, the weird I mean, part. They crave the discipline and the, it's really weird. You know, and it's, I, th there are, it's, so you have this entire infrastructure of people who have kind of bought into abuse, yep. who have bought into this idea that this is how it has to be, this is how, where greatness is achieved, this is the path to success. Now and all it's of romantic, a sudden, and, and it's, it's romantic, romantic but now well. it's, you know, there's some people who are saying, well, that wasn't right, and 
I'm very wary. <laughs> I, I just think that's a lot to fix. Well, they don't and, care, first of all. Like, I mean, even talking to male chefs who do care, who are big time to be connected with a lot of people, nobody gives a shit. None of these cooks care. They don't care about this conversation at all. And so I, that, to me, is like the first step, is how do you get their attention? And part of the way that I'm choosing to get their attention is like through other conduits, like famous white men that they look up to. And that's it's very manipulative. Explain, like, d d dig into that manipulation a little bit more. The, um, you're trying to get male men in positions of power who you think others will listen to, yeah. to say what? To get on side, to like to talk about how these the, the systemic abusive structures of, of the restaurant business need to be reimagined, rebuilt, burned down, start over. Even in instances, maybe particularly in instances when they built those same cultures themselves? Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I'd like to think, and I don't know that I actually believe this, but I'd like to think people can make some changes, or at least appear to, and sometimes maybe that's enough. You know, maybe appearing to make the change, eventually you settle into the change, or fear being the greater motivator than, you know, benevolence, like, mm -hmm. or altruism, rather, really. Like, you're not going to get people out of the goodness of their heart to change the structures, but maybe if they're afraid, you know, that, that they are going to get caught or that their behavior, there certainly has to be men looking around their kitchens right now going, am I crossing lines? Did I cross lines? Are there bones buried in my backyard? Like, they have to be a little bit scared even as they somehow at the same time don't give a shit, mm -hmm. which I think is a really strange thing. And it's hard for me to imagine, but I'm, I think that's what's happening. Um, I feel like a signal would be that there was change occurring. You know, one of the, of the complicated features of, of the news around um, the revelation, revelations in the restaurant industry, and I'm not, I mean, some of them are, are shocking, but there is this element, kind of back to what I was talking about before, that it had been normalized, that this, this behavior had been normalized, and I sort of feel as if the, unless you have kind of a mass admission of guilt on people who haven't been called out. That to me is the piece about when, you know, when you kind of call, you say only five men are kind of part of this conversation. I've wondered if it's because those five men happen to be the only ones who think that maybe they have a clean record. And that others oh, don't feel that they have the authority. Oh, there's certainly know, the fear and, of being called a hypocrite, absolutely. And I think it would be healthy if people would be like, look, <laughs> it's over now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I shouldn't, don't do what I've done. You know, like, we're going to change now. But I these no mea life. culpas that, I mean, the ones that I've seen, they're so light on the mea or whatever. <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> and I, oh, I yelled at someone once. Like, no, buddy, you like, you choke people out in the walk-in and you punch people in the face and everybody knows it and nobody talks about it. Um, well, <laughs> it would be nice if more people were fessing up. Uh, but, I, mean, I, I, I do think that would be more cultural, as, as cultural transforming it would as be brilliant. some of the journalism. So it would also be a very and, savvy business move. Oh, if I you're going to be the dude that comes forward and said, look, I used to punch people in the walk-in, um, I was the worst asshole boss, I definitely like sexually harassed a bunch of servers, and you write that piece, and then you like come forward, oh my god, you'll be a fucking hero. Like, so, like I can't believe no one's done it yet. <laughs> They're so dumb, honestly. <laughs> do you have uh, hashtag not all chefs? Okay. Do you have any um, theories as to why now um, that these things have come to the surface in a sort of a flood? I mean, Hollywood is our royalty, I guess. I just made that up right now. I've not thought about this. Like, I don't know. I think that that's part of it, that, you know, that this moment and the Weinstein was so powerful and so many people got behind it and so many people that are, like, famous white women, let's be real, um, came forward. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's you, not the most intersectional movement. Um, do you think, I, mean, I don't know how much political news you guys get from the U.S., but we have a newish president. And I, I, 
I mean, do you think Trump has anything to do with it? Um, yeah, I mean, are you leading the witness? Like, do you think I'm not going to get to that? You're like, hey, obviously it's <laughs> this thing. Yeah, I mean, of course. We've already <laughs> run over, so I... <laughs> the cultural climate in America is pretty fighty right now. And, yeah, I'm sure that that's a big part of it, is that people, you know, I, I, I've joked many times, but it's, like, not a joke that, like, if we're not careful, we're all, we're all going to be um, trussed up in burgundy headdresses by summer. Like, I feel like this is... It, as powerful, and you know, that's where the pessimism comes in. Like, there's this moment that has happened because we're, we're angry, and rightfully so, but how do we keep it moving? How do we keep people paying attention to it? How do we keep it on, like, on the front burner? Mm -hmm. Because people kind of get tired and bored of these things and saturated. You know, the, the, that, the, the piece about Trump is something that's come up in conversations with people with, in interviews I've had with um, um, activists and so forth it, 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 since last fall. And it brings up, and, and perhaps this is, a, I, I wondered if perhaps, you know, the fact that you live in Canada, if like Canada could actually model something that was a little bit easier to do there than here. We're about to elect the crackhead mayor's brother <laughs> as the premier of Ontario. So I don't think we're allowed to be that smug. I don't, I'm not suggesting a smugness, but let me just get to the, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an energy that I felt. In, you know, we're still very new. This, this, these revelations, and if you want to call it a movement, it's still very new, right? You've alluded to this. Right. It's something that, like, we kind of don't know. We're still stewing in anger. You're still stewing in anger. People are but still like stewing in anger. anger. Like the, a super fun anger. But, so there's a lot we don't know about where the maze is going to go. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I feel I've seen where I live in Louisiana, which is a very red state, um, I was, when I did the reporting I did, I tried very hard to stay away from language and stay away from some reporting that, that, that veered into politics because I fear that it could get issues around that should be nonpartisan about how people are treated in the workplace could get sucked up in the culture war and become, you know, this is a bunch of socialist nonsense. Which is so And crazy. I think that that, it, that could happen, and I think it actually, I've seen signs that it already has. And I wonder if, you know, despite what you said, if, if, if that has been something that it has worried you at all in Toronto. Wait, I don't know what you're asking me. If that, if you've had this fear of like the um, complaints about uh, the issue of sexual harassment, the right. issue of civilized workplaces for women for all genders, could turn into something that is only what liberals give a shit about, yeah, and that, okay. that and that conservatives all. It's fake news. It's a bunch of lily livy blah blah blahs, and and lose, you know, and and, and the con you get, you lose the conversation and you lose this idea that no, this is about everyone. Well, first of all, yeah, I would I want to say that I don't think about that stuff, or I, I refuse to identify it as politics because I think that does it a disservice. That like my existence and my right to you know equitable pay and safe work that doesn't mm -hmm. seem like politics to me, um, even though I understand of course that everyone thinks it is. Um, I've also already chosen like the way that I'm going to be about this, and very fortunately, my restaurants are small enough that they can be busy, and I don't really need to worry that I've like put put off 50% of the population, and I don't care. You know, like I, I can't imagine. I always sort of liken it to being a French bistro and serving Nazis. Like, what the fuck are you thinking? Um, don't do it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I've made that decision. A lot of restaurateurs don't make that decision because it's a really hard business. And so restaurateurs notoriously don't get involved in politics yeah, because <laughs> they like money, I guess. Um, so that's, like, that's a part of it, too. And, I, I, you know, this is, like, doing this and being the way that I am, it hasn't won me friends in my hometown. Uh, like, I, I, like, I don't want to use the word pariah, but... I'm not like super well loved by the restaurant bros in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, so what? It's worth it. <laughs> the um, 
I want to. I just made that all about me. I was like, I don't know what you asked. Let me just tell you a little story. I mean, I, I asked about <laughs> like you answered, oh, but but of. but it's yeah. the I, I think that what you, you the decisions you've made to come to to be outspoken, come what may. Are you know? I think that that is important for that's important for people to do. It's I get that to I admire. make those decisions. Well, that's I mean that's I get to make those decisions based on a lot of privilege. You know, like I understand that. I understand that this is like that. I am coming from. I probably got more radical the more money I made, the mm -hmm. more comfortable I felt in my in my life, the more secure I felt in my job, the more I didn't feel I had no fear that you know there was there were no repercussions from. A boss, you know, the boss is the customer is your boss. So, um, yeah, like I, I, I definitely understand why some people can't do this and choose not to. Absolutely, but there's a hell of a lot of people with even more privilege than I do saying nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sentence was very wrong. The um, and just to, the, the 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 bigger issue that I fear, and then I want to I want to offer people an opportunity to ask questions themselves, so if you have some, think of them. Um, Real questions, none of this, no more speeches. of a comment, really? <laughs> Is that the, just saying, just saying. the President of the United States has been accused of worse right. than, um, oh, I mean, you and that's a very, crazy. it's a very, very difficult, that's a, it's, it's an inescapably difficult dynamic. Yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> And because it, it ultimately makes sexual harassment politics, because this won't go away, and that's what really worries me. And, I don't know. And how I you wonder guys do if it, living in a red honest. state makes my worry greater than it does. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's kind of what I was meaning by that. And uh, and it just it it mean it it makes the conversation to unfold in this environment. I, I think really charged and, and, and ripe for folks to dismiss because they've been told to dismiss these charges about the most powerful person in the country. Yeah. You know? And, and they've stood by it, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I just, I don't, I think it's an escape. I mean, hypocrisy is astounding. It's an escape like, dynamic. It blows um, my mind. The, um, I would, are there people who have questions for Jen? Can we start back there? Hey, we walked in. We were trying yes. to find this place oh, yeah. together. <laughs> no, we were lost together. And the person got no sex drugs. Yes. Um, so my question is this. Um, what I find really disturbing about this whole movement, um, I've been in the industry, but not as a chef, uh, tangentially on, on other ends. And I have seen the culture of chefhood has this bro culture. You're not good enough. You're not tough enough. What more to the point is, what bothers me is when women chefs have also been complicit in this. The April Bloomfield bit, completely, and I've seen this in so many other female dominated kitchens as well. And they use the guise of, this is not victim blaming, the question is, what is wrong with this culture? that allows for this to happen to begin with and to put the blame on everyone. I mean, women can be bros too. Like, oh, it's, and, and also, you know, I think that we're, we're, we're sent all sorts of cultural messaging, overwhelming cultural messaging, that men are the winning team. And we want to be on the winning team. So, I mean, I've certainly had those moments in my life. And, um, yeah, I think, I think it's disheartening. Internalized misogyny is gross and difficult, and, and it's the, the reason that the system doesn't break. We're we're holding it up. It's fucking sad. I don't know what to do about it. I wrote a book. Hi. Like kind of okay, picture of rainbows and then bluebirds, a little pot of gold. And, you know, and, you know, we're disgusting people. We tell horrifying jokes. We're, we've got like brutal senses of humor, but there's a real, there's a careful sense, and I, I think that's partly by gatekeeping. 
um, you know, hiring people that aren't terrible, looking into people. Um, but there, it's really, it's a fun environment, and we don't cross lines, and, if, and we don't make people feel bad. We don't make people the butt of the jokes. It's like a really easy thing to do, to not make someone the butt of the joke. And I, and there's no bullying, like there's just none of that. Um, and if there ever is stuff that happens, it is dealt with swiftly. Uh, it's a small enough company that I can, you know, every complaint can come to managers or to me, and I've been working with my managers for five or ten years. I'm pretty sure they're not harassing anyone, but I would certainly listen to somebody tell me that they were. Um, with bigger companies, obviously the HR department shouldn't be there to protect the company, which of course is what it's been there for historically. And it's a complete mess and needs to be completely rebuilt. How many employees do you have? Like a 70 ish. Yeah, maybe more. Yeah. Um, right here? Me? Yeah. I just wonder if either of you have um, a theory about what it is that's unique about the hospitality business. I <laughs> no, no, no. You mentioned a, a minute ago, you mentioned during the talk that you know, the business doesn't seem to be suffering at the restaurants of the people you know, that have you know, no, been reported on. And, but what's interesting to me is that the, you know, you look at the entertainment business, right? Like they couldn't release Louis C.K.'s last movie, that kind of show. You know, Harvey, Wa the Miramac, or the Weinstein Company is filed for bankruptcy. There seems to be a much steeper price from the audience or the consumer in other industries than there is in the hospitality business. No one wants to give up their faith. Okay, yeah, so their right. faith. No one wants to give up their faith. Right. Like, it's a hard enough time giving up Louis. Um, right, but it's, it's, a, it's a simple, I just wonder if you have any theories as to what it is that's different about that relationship. Because yeah, a lot sure. of people have very personal connections to entertainers, and these people are basically off the face of the earth now. But these restaurants are so full. But I think that's, I think that's what it is, though. It's like your neighborhood bistro, if there's this sort of disconnect between the idea of somebody as an abuser and, like, the burger is so good, though. And I think that people are so connected to that idea of, like, food and feelings even more so. I mean, there's a different funny person. You can turn to a different funny dude. I mean, there's all sorts of good comedians. Is there a burger around the corner from your house that's that juicy? I don't know. I don't know if I care to find out. Like, I think, I think that's part of it. I think it's really, like, people don't want to give up their favorite things. They don't. Restaurants are fantasy driven as well. There's that whole like the behind the curtain idea, and there's the, the ugliness that you don't see, and here's this like wonderful front of house. Um, and so I think people have a hard time even connecting that. I, I don't know. It's like it's kind of shocking to me, like to see that the spot pig is still like packed. It's crazy. I mean, I've got a, a the, sort right? of a theory that's more New Orleans specific about why. His restaurants haven't seemed, uh, you know, I don't know. He, he has many restaurants and a bunch of stuff that's happened in the environment. Like, I have done some reporting that, that suggests that they're not, these places aren't just crickets. Um, and the first is that the, you know, these people have a voice through social media. And, you know, they've made it very clear to me that they just think I'm a dishonest reporter. Getting it's getting an essence of the Paul. Yeah. Like people yeah. are making a I mean, choice you know, to be like very resonant about it. This is not all, you know, not everyone reads the news, not everyone believes the news. Uh, some people think the news is just a bunch of bullshit. And so there's that. But also in New Orleans it's very much a tourist town where while I think John did get his celebrity made his restaurants very popular. It's been so long that, you know, once you get into this circuit of like, I'm just going to ask the concierge, or I've been here before, I mean, people are kind of going there without really, you know, maybe not read the news, maybe don't think about John, you know, as owning this restaurant. You know, there's a bunch of just like muscle memory that people go through life abiding in ways that others don't. It's an and it's interesting too, like the people that know a lot about restaurants, like we always like to think that everybody knows about this, that they like, it's pretty niche. The, um, I mean, I know, like, just from the, you know, I, I work at a news organization that pays attention to digital press. Um, the story that I wrote was, like, counted as viral for us. Um, 
the 10 best restaurants in New Orleans has gotten three or probably on its way to four times more page views than that. Um, you know, and, and that, and there's a lot of, mine doesn't contain best restaurants, but there's a lot out there that do that still come up when you Google. You know, and they don't say, this is the place you might have heard about, right? <laughs> so. Can you also maybe speak to the, the challenges or maybe the, the nuances in the hierarchy in these restaurants? I mean, there are CDCs and executive sous chefs and things like that where the person making the, you know, the problem is all the way at the top and there are so many people under them. And what is the responsibility then of the... I think that boycotts wouldn't be fair to to the you know 72 other people that aren't grabbing ass. But I gave it a lot of thought and I talked to a lot of people about it. And I honestly think there's other restaurants that like just go. Everybody should it should stop. The place should. Like, that's that's It's okay. That's just like a really interesting. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just like, it's just all this way. It's just, yeah, it's just, you know, you, they, they, I think that there is that, I, I don't know if that's exactly what you asked, like if that's, but I think everything is top down. That actually reminds me of that stupid quote the other day about the fish head and the stink and something or other. Um, and, yeah, if, you, if you're running an organization like that and you don't know what's happening with your sous chef, like, because it could be the sous chef that's maybe responsible, or who knows. So yeah, I, I think it's really complicated, but I think once something like that is happening, it's out there, it's proven, it's reported on, like, you know, what's our what's our, number, our bar for believing? Like, 20 women? We need 20 women to all have the same stories, and they all need to not know each other. Is that where the bar is, roughly? Um, so once that happens, like, shut that fucking place down. Everybody has to go work somewhere else. It doesn't exist anymore. It's no good. It's tainted forever. I think I kind of think that. I mean, I can just add one short thing, and then we have time for one, maybe two quick questions. But that uh, when I worked on the story that I did, you know, there was a lot of people who were being used. It wasn't just the story about um, the guy whose name was on the marquee. And... And I have some like mixed feelings about this, but our position as a news organization was that, it, and this became particularly true after we found out that they had 1,200 employees and zero human resources professionals. <laughs> this made it easier. <laughs> but was that you guys are setting the tone, you guys own the place, you guys get a pitch off this shit, this is we're holding you responsible. What about when somebody who's in an organization like that Who's all like, it totally wasn't me. I was trying to make it better, but they're clearly lying. I mean, which one is lying? Okay. Shia, are you kidding? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff there. I, the, um. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like that was so, so gross to me. Uh, she's I read every comment you. on that Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you did mention that to make your point very clear that you need the five white men to do it. And why do you think that you don't need to go to the minority like you did? I mean, you were a minority. Why don't you go to the women? Why don't you go to the, uh, the chefs of culture too? Why do you insist that only the big chefs can make that move, or the big white five men, white people? Why do you bring the color? Look, I wish it wasn't true. To a minority, but why don't you think that more might? few minorities will make a bigger impact too. Yeah, I mean, you know what, that's a great point. Like, I think, I, I think that, that the power and the money is in the hands of so few people and so many of them are white men that it does feel like to take even a, a slow, grinded step forward, you need their support. And I, I don't like that. Like, it doesn't make me feel good. Um, and wouldn't it be great if everybody could like band together? But I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Because I think if you put a force against the minority, it might yeah. be a much better way to get your voice heard because the minorities are the ones who have suffered more. I agree. I agree with you. Thank you. One more. Um, I have a better. One. Good luck! <laughs>
let me, I just want to, so everyone else can kind of hear and correct me if I don't get the gist right, but that she believes that a lot of people out there could be saying, you know, don't do this, this is bad behavior, only out of fear and not out of genuine decency. Is that a fair? And how do you tell the decent guys from the posers? And I said, good luck! <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's of course. It's like, you know, think about, think about how often we put ourselves in danger as women. You know, you go on a date with a stranger and, like, you are taking, like, a huge risk. And, and men never, rarely, sorry, men don't as often have to feel that or understand exactly how it is. It's not, like, not saying that men cannot relate to it or don't understand what I'm talking about, but generally speaking, this is a very woman-specific thing that fear. And we just learn to navigate it from a very young age. Um, so, and that's why we have such great guts, you know, and you have to, you have to, you have to listen to it. It's not always good to tell you the truth. Um, you have to surround yourself with people who hopefully are like-minded. I don't fucking know. It's hard. I also think that, that what you talk about, which is undeniably frustrating, that, you know, people sort of acting not out of human decency, but acting out of fear of consequence for themselves, is I don't see a way past that stage. No. You know, like, and I do think sometimes about, I, I reported my story at the same time in New Orleans they were taking down the Confederate monuments. It made me think a lot about race. And not that I don't, I need an excuse to, but the, um, But you we, do, though. Sometimes. I mean, really, I mean, like, a lot, a lot of white men, not sure. all white men, like, just basically, I've, I've talked to so many men who are just like, well, I never had to think. Like, well, no fucking kidding. <laughs> it's hard not to in normal life. Yeah. But the, um, my point was going to be that, you know, we had established across some decades now, at least, we, we clearly didn't eliminate racism, but we did come to a point where it was generally accepted to be socially a football. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that, you know, we... That what you're talking about is people acting on like, I don't want to be, a, you know, I don't want to commit a faux pas. And if if that's not genuine, yes, that sucks. But I don't, but see, I don't see how I don't see how you get not past. I don't see how you have a stage that doesn't include this period. Of, and then their kids don't hear that language, and then maybe their kids yeah. are genuinely not racist. Like would that yeah. be nice? Like, and it won't lim- it won't eliminate the thought. You know, like it won't just like. Passing laws against segregation didn't eliminate racism. But 